Hello everyone, just doing a quick mic check, although I'm only gonna be speaking for the first few minutes, so my mic really doesn't matter. But let me know in the chat if you hear me okay. Welcome everyone. I sorry that music is going to stop very abruptly there because I don't have a nice fade transition. But welcome to night two of the uh, Mouse Sees the Collaborative Zine for the Computer Mouse Conference simulcast along with the Computer Mouse Conference. I've got over here in my monitor the Mouse Conference stream, and I don't believe it started yet, which is good because as soon as it does start, I'm gonna switch over and you'll, if you're watching this collaborative zine, you will get to hear all of the audio from the actual conference. Um, maybe you're wondering what is the Computer Mouse Conference and what is going on here? So um, I, um, <clears throat> Um, I am going to tell you about all of that. Sorry, I'm like pulling up the page that I have information about it. Okay, so the conference, the music computer mouse conference is organized by um, Emma um, and Ashley. This is the second night of it. There are a wonderful set of panels and talks and all sorts of things happening. I posted the link in the ch in the chat, um, which is at uh, complicatingthecomputermouse.net. Let me post that again. Sorry, I'm a little bit, it's been a long day. How's everybody doing? <laughs> what this stream is, is it is one of the most incredible things I've ever had the chance to witness, which I got to uh, see the first night of it. Um, this is a essentially like a live performance in a way, but of the mouse sees. So this is live documentation in the form of a collaborative zine for the conference, and it's organized by Neto Bamani. So as the conference is happening in real time, Netta is listening and printing and cutting and just beautifully curating this physical paper zine. Um, I, it's, it's, it's really inadequate for me to try to describe it in words. You really just have to experience it. Um, people are sharing lots of images from it on Twitter that you can find. Um, and you can also check the stream from last night to see images of it. Um, let me tell you a little bit. So, um, you, by the way, you are welcome to participate in the making of this zine. If you go to the Twitter account, the mouse sees. I'm gonna. I'll put this in the chat at the mouse sees. Um, you can uh, tweet at the mouse sees with um, the answer to the question, what does the mouse see, or any other thoughts or reactions you have, images you have. Both Netta and I are tracking our mouse movements, um, and, those, and, and, and little visualizations of those mouse movements will be tweeted automatically from that account. Um, Netta is an abolitionist who is interested in parsing information in histories while making things by hand together with human and non-human computers. Um, you can find Netta on her website, on Twitter, Arena, and Instagram. All of those links are in this video's description. I'm just going to sit here and copy-paste them right into the chat so you have them as well. So I please encourage you to learn more about Netta and her work. Um, I also want to mention that you should join Netta, the Computer Mouse Conference, and the Coding Train in supporting Survived and Punished New York's uh, Spring Mutual Aid Group, Mutual Aid Group Fundraiser. So I'm going to paste a link to that. It's in the pinned comment. I'm going to paste a link to that in the um, chat here. So Survived and Punished is a grassroots prison abolitionist organization and allied media project that, um, that exists to end the criminalization of survivors of domestic and sexual violence. So we are raising money to provide commissary packages and other material support for criminalized survivors. Please donate as we continue, and we being survived and punished, continue to expand our giving to more survivors and provide care to our communities. 
All donations are tax deductible. That's for um, U.S. to the fullest extent of the law. So I want to just say a huge, wonderful thank you and an and excited, um, happy moment to say that uh, Survived and Punished reached um, their goal of $100,000, I think, to the generosity, hopefully, of some of the from some of the viewers from last night um, and of everyone from... I see the mass conference started, so I got to wrap this up. Um, um, uh, from, um, from the uh, people who donated last night, the links on the uh, com from the conference website... Um, but I just want to encourage you to continue to donate. So any extra money raised beyond the goal will go to support the same work. So if you were just about to make a donation and you were sad that the goal was already reached, um, please still do. Um, and um, Coding Train is um, making a donation um, as part of this um, live stream as well. And as soon as I stop talking, I'm going to go and do that right now. And I hope that you will consider matching that donation. Okay, I got to switch to the conference audio and to Netta's uh, desktop. That's what you'll be hearing. I'll be in the chat um, all night. You have questions, ask in the live chat. Um, you can go back and forth between the two feeds or keep them both on. And um, thank you so much um, to everyone. In lots of talks yesterday, this theme of trying to unpack the really problematic past of technology in this way shows up time and time again and is, is I would say, even more referenced today um, in talks Definitely. like Dorothy's and, all, and Ryan's as well. Definitely. <clears throat> we have a couple of reminders for you. So yesterday we had the, I, I just want to say like the joy of watching Netta Bomani create the live zine in the stream. And the live zine is linked in the website that you're watching this on. So just below our video, you can find the link to Netta Bomani's uh, live zine. And Dan Schiffman made an incredible bot that lets you contribute to the zine. So if you tweet at the mouse sees, then you can send Netta screenshots or texts or images or links to videos. You know, the list goes on and on and, and Netta will fold that into the creative practice of creating the zine, which will be really, really cool. Yes, and um, additionally, I think if you're watching right now, you should see a chat room on the right. Yeah. Uh, some people I know yesterday had issues with this, so um, I think one of the tricks is to refresh your browser, um, and it might take just a second for the chat to show up, but it should. If it doesn't, I'm so sorry. It's a technical error. It's something we have to just deal with. Um, but it looks like a lot of you are in there already. There's a lot of ASCII art. Uh, <laughs> we're thankful for that. Um, and before you join the chat, uh, please click on the link for the code of conduct um, before participating so that we can make sure that we are participating in a way that is meaningful and engaging with each other. Yeah. Um, that is linked right below the stream. Yeah. And we've got some thank yous. Right. Yesterday was so spectacular, and it really would not even be 1% possible <laughs> without all of the tech support that Culture Hub has given us. Sangmin, who is just over here, uh, again, like just doing, doing the hard work today of switching between um, streams and just such an incredible human being. Um, Sangmin is a Culture Hub creative technologist, um, and we really just like cannot thank you enough. Um, Deandra as well, Deandra Anthony, uh, another wonderful staff member at Culture Hub, and Deandra is the lead technician, and we've worked so closely with Deandra getting everything set up, and um, she's with us remotely, yes. <laughs> but like in our hearts as well, <laughs> um, making sure that everything runs smoothly, so we're just really grateful for Culture Hub, as well as the Media Archaeology Lab and the Processing Foundation and the Coding Train for all of their incredible support and helping us stream the live zine and, and be able to pay speakers as well. Yes. Um, and that they're all linked below as well, so take time to check out um, their websites when you can. Um, so we just got out of Ed's workshop, yeah. Um, and Ed Bear is uh, an amazing uh, teacher, an amazing um, artist and um, technologist and musician. Um, and there's something he said during the workshop that. Uh, I'm still holding on to, he said that there is a global infrastructure inside the body of the mouse. Yeah. And this is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's something that I, I wish that in my own, in our own, um, you know, tech educational experience that, that that was something that was kind of given to us when we were learning about um, 
physical computing and technical objects to, to kind of engage with this kind of um, terrible fact that there's a whole global infrastructure baked into uh, a microchip. Right. Yeah. yeah, and Emma and I were just chatting before the stream and just talking about how when it's framed that way, how just frankly unacceptable it is that we don't have the perception of just how incredibly enormous the impact is of creating these pieces of technology. Like I'm holding my hand out like this because I'm imagining a mouse. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and and I think that like, you. right, exactly, we'll put our <laughs> mice together. And I think that the, uh, the, the idea that we don't have that perception, even though it's underneath the shell of what it forms the exterior of lots of our technology is, is just really, when it's framed like Ed Bear has framed it, it's really appalling. Um, because when you open up the technology, if we had learned about physical computing through the act of a teardown that framed it in that context, you would see circuit boards that were stamped or like printed in India. You would see like elements of our of our components that you would have to unscrew and peel the glue back of, right? Pieces that were toxic that you wouldn't be able to touch. It's really, as it's very unglamorous. It's very unglamorous and it's a very visceral experience, yeah, to kind of get into a chip um, and to kind of be met with the complexity of that chip and like the impossibility of uh, hacking that chip and using it for your own means. Um, and another thing we were talking about earlier is like uh, just also the ease with which, uh, which, with which we learned physical computing and the ease with which you could just buy new components yeah. um, and not reuse components. There's like a, yeah. Yeah, because you, so we've, Emma and I have both done like a bunch of school, <laughs> several degrees in, in technology. When you learn about physical computing or even upgrade your skills, there is a glamour to it. You do unbox really shiny parts that have like very famous names, you know. Uh, like I'm thinking of a very particular blue circuit <laughs> board right now. And that those boxed, they have great branding, they come with stickers. Like there's a glamour that feels like you're joining a club, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, it, it really, it really continues to divorce you from the like possible the, the possible and and in fact like actual destruction of a lot of this technology because you start to feel that kind of energy that Cesar was talking about in his talk yesterday when you open up your computer and you're met with that like Windows 95 sound and that mm -hmm. beautiful glamorous desktop background and you start to feel energized and sort of like empowered by all of that which continues to divorce you from the from the uh, from the way in which you might feel connected to the destruction. Totally. And uh, this is a very, very good segue into yeah. our first screening tonight. Um, did we cover, we covered everything. We yeah, to yeah. Right? Yeah, so our next screening um, is a video by Ryan Clark. It's titled Nature's Notifications. Uh, and after the screening, we will be doing a Q&A with Ryan. We're very excited. To like get live. To talk with him live. Yes, this is he's the joining first us live. <laughs> this is the first non-host live conversation we've had. So Ryan's gonna, so save your questions. Yes. You know, he'll be here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so cool. we'll go to that video now and we'll see you uh, in a little bit. Awesome.
To persuade females to come close and admire his plumes, he sings the most complex song he can manage. And he does that by copying the songs of all the other birds he hears around him, such as the kookaburra. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. And again. And now a camera with a motor drive. And that's a car alarm. And now the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby.
All right, we're back. Uh, and we're back with Ryan. And it, I really, <laughs> I really feel like this deserves an incredible round of applause. And yes. you'll find out a little bit more why <laughs> even further so. <laughs> Um, but we're here with Ryan. Uh, uh, we're so excited to be live having this conversation because Emma and I spent all day yesterday just talking to each other. So now we get to talk to you as well. Um, yeah. So I'm going to read Ryan's bio. And uh, Emma and I already decided that this is perhaps the coolest bio we've ever come across. So it reads, a selective chronologist, R.C. Clark, notices the passage of time through both an ethnomusicological lens as a co-editor at Dweller Electronics and oceanographically as a PhD student in coastal ge geological sciences in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, so welcome, Ryan. Thank you so much. Uh, should we reveal what what we learned while we were watching this together? Yes, but before we do that, I just want to say that someone said in the chat, oh, wow, did not expect to cry at the computer yeah. mouse conference day, too. And I just want to say that I also cried when I watched this video. So did I. Yeah. Um, but I cried without there being captions. We just found out that there were supposed to be captions. So <laughs> Ryan's going to send us yeah. another video with captions that we can watch again. Yeah, we'll post the, um, the non-ambient version of, yeah. of nature's notifications. But I'm glad it worked um, and evoked something uh, for everyone watching. So thank you. And it wasn't just Emma and I and this commenter in the chat. We've been talking about this video for days. Yeah. And it made people at Culture Hub, as we were recording it, recording sessions and talking about sessions cry, we have like friends and family who we've like, you know, let take a peek who have also been really moved by it. So I can only imagine how wrecked we'll be in the captions yeah. version. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I wanted, so I just wanted to, I, I, after reading her bio, after watching uh, the video many times, I'm wondering, like, given that your practice and your um, research through geology, through ethnomusicology, Given that you practice both of these things, I'm wondering like how you define uh, the word chronology or how you define chronology. And because I was thinking that, um, and because your video is like, I don't know so much about time, I think. Um, uh, like my definition of chronology, like I've been taught that order is like beginning to end, like on a linear timeline mm -hmm. or something. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wonder how you think about um, chronology in your practice or in this video. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I think of it through the lens of the observer. So it has a lot to do with the observer effect where how time can go or how time moves, um, whether someone's actually watching or noting that passage of time, uh, can alter. So it can like speed up or slow down and considering humans, I guess, in relation to like deep time. So again, like as a geologist, you know, like 4.3 billion years on the earth and then 13.4 billion for the universe, you know, we're here for such a small portion of that. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, um, I don't know, I guess, you, I guess you start to, whether subconsciously or not, start to view things a little bit differently. And when, when you see sort of a, a loss of, of a time or a climate, um, it, it, it's you can see that this moment has shown itself up uh, before. So to speak more literally, like the Pleistocene, like three million years ago, uh, the sea level was like, you know, uh, pretty much the same levels. But uh, the difference is like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was like much different. So that's us, right? That's anthro that's uh, that's anthropogenic change. And so understanding time, you start to see like the small little differences and I guess I'm interested in what can cause those differences and um, bring attention to them because uh, I do think that we have the capability to change uh, change that. Right, and I guess that also it's a it's a really interesting definition of time as well because it also references scale in a way that's different yes. than the way that I imagine time in a very conventional sense, right? That doesn't, my, my, my reference of, of time, the scale is like hour to millisecond. That's as far as scale gets, but this definition requires so much more observation of, of, of scale in, in, a, in a way that's really exciting to learn about. For sure, for sure. There's this, um, 
there's this writer called Gabrielle Hecht, where she talks about uh, inter intrascalar vehicles. And it's like, okay, well, what sort of um, examples or mindsets or, or concepts can we start to implement to like think larger, right, uh, in terms of scale? And uh, I think going into geology, if there's one thing that has benefited, benefited me is it, that topic alone is an interscalar vehicle. Yeah. And in watching or making and editing these videos, uh, yeah, I was just trying to produce another kind of interscalar vehicle so we can kind of not remove ourselves, but, you know, see what kind of agency that we either have or don't have. And right. um, maybe the, the text for the, the caption version might, you know, poke a bit more at that. Um, right. But, you know, I think the emotion gets across uh, without the captions. Yeah, oh my gosh, the motion really gets across. Definitely. I mean, I think it, it I, the interscalar vehicle, um, I remember reading, maybe it's an essay. I don't know if it's an essay or. Yeah. Yeah. I remember reading that. And yeah, it did really do that. Uh, it yeah. did carry me through. Like, I, I really felt, I think that's why it's so um, emotional because it goes in and out, and there's like, you can really feel a dissonance. You can really mm -hmm. uh, feel that kind of uncomfortable dissonance. And then that last animation, I feel kind of just like draws it all out, like draws all the kind of tension out that is yeah. held in going yeah. in between. Um, right. Yeah, we were talking about that dissonance a lot. Yeah. We've been talking about the like video and how it holds this really uncomfortable dissonance because it's peppered with sounds that we have just burned into our memory uh, mm -hmm. that are really tied to nostalgia and then also shows us images and videos of things we don't see that often unless we seek it out, but we subconsciously know are happening. And I think yeah. we're not often brought to the confrontational moment where we have to see those two things, the like tech we have like heartfelt feelings for and the questionable heartfelt feelings for and the destruction that is you know, manifesting as a result of that tech. We don't, we don't have many instances of being like brought to the confrontation of the interlinking of those two things. Um, so there's yeah. a lot of dissonance in the video because of that. It's uncomfortable. Abs absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, I will say, I definitely have nostalgia. Like the Windows 95 theme, I, I run back to my mom's, you know, uh, media room with, you know, very wooden, you know, lots of little diskette shelves and all of that. And uh, also, like, he's like, you know, being a sucker for micro composition, like um, in the beginning of that, it, it talks about how Brian Eno was prompted by Microsoft in, hmm. in I think, 94 um, to produce a, a, a very, like, small amount of sound, but evokes optimism, uh, connection, you know, all of these different things. They threw these words at him. And wow. one, I think he landed on it perfectly. Wow. But it, what it also did is that it sort of, um, it encapsulates this idea of like this uh, blind optimism of the 90s, of like that kind of tech boom. And uh, there's a lag of that feeling, that optimism, which you still hear in like these iOS sounds that I pepper in. Um, but obviously uh, the world no longer reflects this sort of optimism. So it, it starts with like, again, CO2, like talking about how CO2 uh, atmospheric levels are like rising and tipping points for climate. Um, but are these sounds reflecting, uh, you know, nature uh, kind of getting larger and more frequent, uh, mm -hmm. such as like hurricanes and things like that? Um, I, I would say no. Uh, that's the dissonance that uh, is there. But um, I think it it was definitely a meditation to investigate that for my own sake, because, yeah, I, I love all these sounds, um, especially those Windows 95 ones. There's a special <laughs> place in my heart for, for all those guys. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's, it's both, like, so <laughs> manipulative <laughs> as, like, a design <laughs> for sound, and it's so manipulative, but it's not unlike so many other kinds of like methods of, of, of sensory experiences that are like forcing us to feel a particular kind of way. It's just unfortunate that like we're being forced to feel a particular kind of way about such a, um, sure. yeah, like a, a particular kind of destructive property. Yeah. yeah. What was it like? We were wondering about what it's like to make the video, right? Yeah, we were wondering a little bit just about the process. I mean, it was cool to hear that you were thinking about um, Gabrielle Hecht's interscalar vehicle, but maybe mm -hmm. if there's any uh, 
I don't know, other, other ways of making this video um, in terms of, I don't know, how you approach your research maybe, or how you, even just like sound, like uh, music and sound, like yeah. how that played into the process of putting this video together. And also, how much footage of devastating natural yeah. environments did you have to sift through to get to where you <laughs> landed? Like we were, we were yeah. destroyed watching the like couple handfuls of clips that you showed us, but you know, video art mm -hmm. as it is, you got to look at us so much more to to whittle down to what you want to use, right? Like, what was that experience like too? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, well, it's always been tough. So I'm I'm in New Orleans and I'm from Baton Rouge, so I've lived in the South. Uh, my whole life. And so even as a kid, you know, the idea of kind of hurricanes and hurricane season um, has kind of always been around me. And so maybe I'm desensitized to it. But on top of that, being a coastal geologist, you know, my work is rooted in the sustainability, the physical sustainability of, uh, of Southern Louisiana. And to do that, you have to watch so much mm. destruction. And that's another sense of scale that, um, Louisiana and other coastal cities definitely face more than, you know, like more inland cities. Um, right. You know, we're kind of faced with tragedy and just complete destruction and into the world um, multiple times and like almost in a singular generation. Mm -hmm. Hurricane Camille, Hurricane Betsy, Katrina, um, you yeah. know, right next to Houston, Harvey. So um, a lot of my actual, not actual, a lot of my research um, is, you know, being very intimate with um, a lot of these numbers and understandings of like what happened, how it happened at a very, almost at a person to person level. So like understanding natural hazards and mitigation, um, what's intertwined in that is just it, unfortunately like incredible sadness. So yeah. what I have is this whole array. A lot of these videos are from classes that I've had since 2011. Um, like the Japanese landslide, we were looking at um, land stability um, due yeah. to like saturation of rainwater and we were just looking at rock slides and so you know a lot of these videos yeah. I've just kind of always been thinking about and um, what what better time to show it off than at the computer mouse conference <laughs> uh, that's I guess that's where my brain went yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of always with these things if anybody knows me and there are some that do uh, in the chat hey um, <laughs> you know I'm always watching YouTube I'm always like hey, check this article out, or the radio is always on in my house, so it's always just kind of picking from these trees that are kind of growing around me. Right. Well, I mean, I don't, I, I can't imagine like a better place than the Computer Mouse Conference. We're so grateful uh, that you so had. Good. Thank you. Yeah, that you, that you sent this video our way and that we get to even further un like dive into it because we get to see like a, a more detailed version with the captions that we'll post yeah, as well. Wait. We get like part two of this, which is actually really novel in a strange way, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think that we, we probably have to close even though I, we have so many more questions and we can find you on Twitter, right? To continue the conversation if people have more questions for you. Yeah, I'm a, what is it? Care Forgotten. Uh, care forgotten, which is again a New Orleans reference. I'm just stuck here, so. <laughs> um, but also be in the chat, which is amazing. If there's anything I could say, is like I love the uh, this chat. I was just staying in here after it was over yesterday. I'm like, I'm gonna miss this when it's over. So shout out to the chat. Shout I'll be in there the uh, answering questions. That was, shout amazing. out to shout out to Emma. Emma built the site. <laughs> Thank you, and Emma. I, I see you in there, Ryan. So yeah, I'm so glad you're there. There are definitely also already yeah. questions there, and we will be posting the video with captions as for soon sure. as we figure that out. So yeah. um, we're sorry about that, but thank yeah. you so yeah. much for your More work. Than fine. Um, yeah, thank you for letting me be included in this. I appreciate it. Amazing. Okay, we'll see you soon. We'll see, we'll see you soon. Soon. All righty. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye. So our next video is Dorothy's. And yes. after Dorothy R. Santos uh, has her video screened, which is just so beautiful, it's called Beyond the Life Cycle of the Object. That video is gonna be followed by a conversation that was pre-recorded between Emma, myself, and Lauren Lee McCarthy in reflection uh, on that video, on Dorothy's video. Yep. And then we'll come back after that as a prelude to the panel. Yes. Yeah, so we'll see you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Hi, everyone. My name is Dorothy Santos. I am the Executive Director for Processing Foundation. And thank you so much for being here. I am going to be presenting today on um, Beyond the Life Cycle of the Object. A little bit more about myself. I love reading, writing, researching, looking at everything, asking questions, and making connections. Uh, I'm really honored, again, to be presenting my work uh, that I feel and I hope will enable a different type of thinking that goes beyond the life cycle of digital and mobile devices and objects in our lives. I also wanted to take the time to thank Emma, Ashley, and Culture Hub and the entire team for putting Mass Conference together and allowing me the opportunity to speak with you all today. So I have something embarrassing to share. Uh, I've been working on knitting a scarf for my sister for the past decade. That's right, I said the past decade. Uh, her favorite color is pink. I'm not even sure if that's her favorite color anymore, to be honest. But the knit and pearl stitches and all the imperfections represent these moments of uh, patience in my life that I had the time to sit and take a break and work with my hands in such a way that continues to feel very familiar. When I was young, my mother taught me how to knit and crochet. And, you know, she wasn't the most patient uh, teacher. Brilliant, but not patient. But one of the things that I realized in her teaching was how she would tell me stories and how she would uh, she would have to actually learn all of these skills. So knitting, crocheting, embroidery, uh, cooking, etc. within school, it was actually compulsory. And it was really difficult to actually mesh uh, a lot more of the F Filipino traditions within that learning. But it also reminded me of how in the Philippines, there's this really long tradition of weaving and craft within the culture itself. But there's something embodied in the practice that becomes ritual and ceremony as well as spiritual. So lately in thinking about how I wanted to prepare for this talk, I leaned in heavily to Lisa Nakamura's writing and research about indigenous Navajo women and the racialization and gendering within the electronic manufacturing industry, specifically with the company Fairchild Semiconductor. And the best way that I understood the world or the, way, the best way that I understand the world, I'm sorry, is, is through artists and poets. And more specifically for today, I wanted to focus on Janice Lobo Sapigao's work and how she, along with Nakamura, deeply influenced the way that I think about objects in our lives and what it means to hold something in our hands that has probably been held and touched and created by, by dozens, if not hundreds of people. And while we may not know for certain, thinking about science fiction writer Ted Chiang's work, the life cycle of software objects, um, and even though this story is about raising a digital pet and it, that evolves into some sentient mind that's akin to a human mind, you know, it also makes me wonder, well, I'm always wondering about what our objects would say to us if they could tell us about where they came from. But today, I, I want to go beyond the life cycle of the object itself, whether it is a mouse, a microchip, a speaker, a laptop, a smartphone. I want for us to remember the human beings responsible for what you hold in your hand and present a type of call to action through the lens of docu-poetics, the way that Sapagal leaves us these types of instructions in her writing and how we might think beyond these objects. And so one of the guiding questions for this conference is this idea of what does the mouse see? And while I'm not talking overtly about mice in terms of the computer mouse, I'm talking more broadly about how we might want to think about the historical, cultural, and societal ramifications and impacts of what it means when the technology industry has imprinted and mapped already how a body is seen within its larger infrastructure which Nakamura talks about in her uh, titled, in her essay titled, Indigenous Circuits, Navajo Women and the Racialization of Early Electronic Manufacture. So I wanted to take a few minutes with some insights, um, my insights of uh, Nakamura's writing before I share Janice's work with you all. So within this writing, Nakamura looked at different types of print media from the Fairchild Semiconductor 
a company from the late 1960s and early 70s and what it meant to be a woman of color, in particular, a Navajo woman working for the company, but for, most importantly, uh, writing this as a way to reveal the profound ways in which Navajo women played integral and vital roles in the digital revolution. She starts off her essay with Donna Haraway's idea of the integrated circuit from a well-known work, The Cyborg Manifesto, and my understanding of how well, this is my understanding of how the human body becomes a part of this integrated circuit. The Navajo women in many ways have become part of the integrated circuits through a mythology and through their nimble fingers, delicate hands and precision focus as their eyes look through microscopes and built the Silicon Valley we know today. I couldn't help but think of the materiality of these objects and from where and how they were sourced. This is the ebb and flow of understanding I feel oftentimes gets forgotten when we finally have the object in our hands. Or how the land for which the Navajo women, or how they became known as the creative class of technology workers. Fairchild Semiconductor strategically bought land at Shiprock, New Mexico to create a manufacturing plant on the reservation to provide jobs to the Navajo people. And while Nakamura doesn't overtly use the term gentrification, she does use the term cultural imperialism that happens at Spring Rock. And there's a type of mapping of the Navajo body that I mentioned. There are cultural traditions and practices of weaving and making situate themselves in the eyes of Fairchild as the best type of individuals, in particular women, to be the makers of microchips and semiconductors due to their dexterity, speed, and precision. Nakamura states, this notion of Navajo as quote unquote industrial produced a complicated identity whose formation relied on the idea that the tribe could be modern, even hyper-modern, precisely as a result of being distinctly Indian, distinctively Indian. Indian identified traits and practices such as painstaking attention to craft and an affinity for metal work and textiles were deployed to position the Navajo on the cutting edge of the technological moment precisely because of their possession of a racialized set of creative cultural skills and traditional pre-modern artisanal handwork, uh, end quote. We see what Nakamura is talking about very much present in Janice's or Janice Sapigal's work. Fairchild led people to believe in a, in a mythology that mapped onto the Navajo woman's body. Again, as I mentioned, and uh, being very redundant and repetitive about this to emphasize. And I think that this is something I feel very powerful about Nakamura reading the archives. And also reminds me of how we might think of Saidiya Hartman's idea of critical fabulation. So I'll stop here to just note that what you're looking at was in the um, semiconductor, you know, decorative, uh, you know, um, uh, brochure. It was a commemorative brochure of, uh, you know, Fairchild Semiconductor Company. So this is this was included. The images you see here were included in that commemorative brochure or print media. So returning back, what can we surmise from the things that we see in media and archives? Now, someone uh, within media studies, this type of media archaeology is so very important to me. But I want to move on to Janice Lobo Sapigal's work, Microchips for Millions. And although I don't like labels, Janice's work is absolute, uh, it's absolutely poetry. But there's this embedded practice and praxis of docu-poetics that is in line with many other writers I so deeply admire, such as Kathy Park Hong, Vanessa Angelica Villarreal, and Banu Kapil. And docu-poetics is a type of writing practice that requires a listening deeply, uh, or pardon me, a deep listening and intentionality uh, to your subject matter. So I wanted to take some time to go through some of the many pages. I'm, I'm only showing a few here of uh, Janice's work. So to the left, you see Microchips for Millions, the, the book cover. This is actually, this, this is her mother. And to the right, you see a page with uh, binary code. And at the top of the page, it reads, let the poetry 
of this page serve as a moment of recognition for the native peoples, the Mwekma Olawni tribe, whose lands we inhabit, uh, uh, contemporary, contemporaneously known as San Jose. And at the bottom, let these pages allow empathy for the immigrant women and their families whose livelihoods are always, always at stake. And so I wanted to also show some of the poetry, which throughout the book, it's really reminiscent of a type of concrete poetry as well as docu-poetics. And so I can't help it. I wish this was, I wish Janice was reading this herself, <laughs> but um, hopefully I can do it some justice. I do feel it's important uh, to, to read through some of the poetry she's written that really reifies a lot of what Nakamura was talking about in her uh, essay. So the assembly line is what we're looking at now, and it has some binary code on it. And a, a lot of the poems uh, that Janice writes appear in, in columns, um, as if like running text, very similar to what we might see in code. And so it reads, my mother is a fab operator. Four days a week, Ma gets up at 4 a.m., boils hot water in a kettle, showers before it screams ready for coffee, watches the news as she pulls on her clothes, jeans and simple tea enough to soak up 12 hours sweat resting in orthopedic shoes that amplify the need for health benefits and overtime. Ma's always on the front line of Silicon Valley shadow. One of thousands of women whose nimble fingers and silence grumbling spin, microchips for millions, powering laptops and cell phones that she herself does not find intuitive enough to use. At the end of every day, she watches the Filipino channel, her swollen feet elevated on the living room couch, a luxury she buys herself and her family. Um, and, and in terms of docu-poetics, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the things that are included in, in uh, Janice's book uh, are snippets found in uh, print media of what has been said of the women who work within uh, these industries. So to the left, you'll see uh, a quoted text that reads, by the early 1980s, Filipinos were one of the largest ethnic groups among Asian workers at National Semiconductor Corporation, NSC in San Jose, California. You see binary code and then you see at the bottom in text again, um, Ma says she's a fab operator. And so just to quickly note, uh, Fairchild Semiconductor was in, in, in Shiprock was uh, operational in the late 60s and 70s, but a lot of this work um, was going overseas to Asia as well as Mexico. And then to the right of the screen, you see another quote. This mostly female labor force was appealing to management for a number of reasons. One, many were fluent in English. Two, many had experience working in Philippine electronics plants. And three, they had a reputation for hard work. And four, they were considered obedient to authority. Again, you see the code. And at the bottom, it says, I know she's an assembly line worker. And so I want to show a couple more pieces that I feel really are um, indicative of what Nakamura was talking about in her research of the Fairchild Semiconductor Archives, but you see it almost come to life in uh, Janice's poetry. So again, before I end, I just wanna share a couple more pieces. This one is called The Clean Room. In order to come in, you must first put on one hairnet, two shoe covers, three gloves, four mask, five hood, six coverall, seven boot covers, eight go goggles, nine gloves, when you exit, you must discard one gloves, two goggles, three hood, four mask, five boot covers. And to the right, you see text that we can assume. It is safe to assume, again, through the docu-poetic style, that this might be um, uh, Janice's mother. Uh, so I'll read that text to the right column. No, you cannot bring anything inside the room. No cell phones, no watch, no nothing. You have to go to the changing room before you go into work. I always wear my headband. They don't like you to wear sneakers. They like you wear the shoes they give you. My feet is hurt. It's hard to breathe sometimes, oh my God. You can only call me on my break, okay? 8.30 or 12.30. I can only wear t-shirts, the loose kind for work. It's better because you sweat a lot. I can't, Balasan, I can't. You have to wear a suit, goggles. Everything is covered, everything. You can't touch anything. You have gloves, they will get mad on you. And finally, something that I wanted 
and I'm barely scratching the surface here uh, in my presentation for you all, but this goes back to what I mentioned with Nakamura may not have overtly said that this is gentrification, but this is a way of how capitalism works through the environment, through um, profiting off the land of peoples and the after effects and ramifications of the environment and, you know, the people that, um, you know, steward the land, but then for generations to come, we see that in the Valley of Toxic Fright, um, which is the last uh, poem that I'll share from Janice's book. So to the left, there's a screenshot of a map of San Jose or um, that county and the center of it, you see, uh, you know, Sunnyvale, uh, Santa Clara, San Jose, and there is a box that is, uh, you know, uh, bolded with the text to the immediate right in white that says, a plume is a long cloud of smoke, a vapor spreading from its point of origin. And to the right of that, this is on the opposite page of the map, is Janice's poem, The Class. In college, I took an environmental racism class, my professor showed a map of my neighborhood in San Jose with curious red dots next to the McDonald's grandma worked at. Near my elementary school, one north of Ma's workplace, he said the dots indicated toxic waste sites, said immigrant women were on the front line of exploitation. Half of the professor's lecture was about the bunny suit. He said employees are told to protect them, are, are told it's to protect them from chemical harm. Bunny suits protect the microchips from human germs. And so thank you for, for listening to all of that. I really do highly recommend um, looking into Janice's work and beyond. So as you see here, going beyond the life cycle of the object and what does that mean? So now that I've shared Janice's work, I wanted to express how I feel um, and how it serves as a conduit to understanding the kind of conditions indigenous women and women of color are subjected to within the electronic manufacturing uh, and technology industries and still to this day. And in sharing my thoughts, which again, barely scratch the surface of what Nakamura and Sapigao's work or Janice's work is doing um, with media, science and technology studies and within the arts, I wanted to share one last important quote from Nakamura's work when she reflects on the depiction of women of color within tech through media, she writes, quote, instead we see Asian women, Latinas and Navajo women and other women of color looking inside digital culture means looking back in time to the roots of the computing industry and the specific material production practices that positioned race and gender as commodities and electronic factories. This labor is temporally hidden within a very early period of digital computing history and hidden spatially. We must look to locales and bodies not commonly associated within these or with these industries in out of the way places to see how race operates as a key aspect of digital platform production, end quote. So with that, I wanted to encourage you all to think about these different ways and that media affects the way we understand narratives being told to us, especially queer, trans, black, indigenous people of color and people with disabilities. I also want to encourage you to all read and examine the works of artists a lot like Janice Lobo Sapigal to understand technology in a way that is outside of the reach of the object and outside of capitalism. I think that's one of the things I really wanted to focus on within this talk but also to remind everyone of the immense amount of work there is for us to do and learning and being accountable within those ecologies. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate you all. And I, I'm, I'm done with my talk. I think, I mean, so yeah, Dorothy doesn't directly talk about the mouse. Um, I don't think at any point, but there's so much um, like indirect connection. And I think like the strongest connection for me was just talking about um, like hands and the hands that go into the making of electronic objects. And I think the mouse, at least in the research that I've done, has is so much about the fact that we hold it and it's this very personal object and yet it's very 
not personal because it doesn't really hold information like you simply hold it all day um and so it's this reminder of the body but it's also a reminder that you know like the violence of the uh the tech that goes into making the mouse or the industry that goes into making the mouse so so for me it is like directly it sits directly within this conference really well um yeah yeah i mean for me it the first thing it made me think about was i guess the thought that dorothy's talk brought up for me was just the way that um when you think about the mouse or any kind of physical artifact of technology um it it feels like there is this direct connection to you know the history of that making of that object like even a mouse that is something personal that you really are the only one that touches maybe was something that was made by someone else and transferred several times and i think a lot of times when we think about you know the way we've been communicating for the past year primarily which is like through screens and networks there's sometimes a tendency to feel like um that history is is separated from it right that there it's more ephemeral maybe maybe um although it's not and i think that was the the other nice part of dorothy's talk was that you know she's talking about microchips so even when we have that feeling that the internet is something intangible in in contrast to something physical you know there is that whole physical infrastructure um that makes me think of like you know ingrid burrington's work also of like just surfacing that that architecture and infrastructure and the physicality of it. I think it's intentionally severed from the physicality of it, right? Um, and I think what's really interesting about Dorothy's is not only does she paint that picture for us in poetry and in storytelling, but also in the presumed uh, prioritization of technology over people. Um, we were just talking about the, as it was airing, we were just talking about the bunny suit comment as well. That was such a, a, a very intense way to end this talk, to really hammer home what is important over who is important in the construction of all of this. And that's even more uh, extended when we realize that these are not stories that we hear in tandem. Like we don't hear stories about the technology and the people in tandem. Maybe you hear about, certainly you hear about inventors or you know, figureheads like Steve Jobs and Doug Engelbert, but you don't hear about the, the fabricators and the technology in tandem. Um, and there's a reason for it. And that reason is um, articulated inadvertently through that bunny suit comment, right? Um, because it's not, it's, it's not who matters, it's not what matters, right? Yeah, the bunny suit comment really, um, or just that idea that it protects the microchip more than it protects the worker, or that it's for the microchip and not the worker, uh, really kind of blew my mind, at least how it was presented in the poem also, like it really hit harder in a way that it hadn't before. Um, and, and I think just like complicates the mouse, like, again, it's this personal object, but, but really is prioritizing your computer over you in many, many ways, I think over and over again, like it's prioritizing the graphical user interface over how you might want to interact with a computer at all, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's funny to think about, you know, user interface or user interaction design or any of these things that um, or even like user centered design. Um, I think what what the talk pointed to is, you know, and what we're talking about is how the, the whole notion of that is really opposite, right, that that it is not about the people in the system, the, the people in the system are really there to serve the underlying structure, which is, you know, capitalism and techno solutionism and, you know, white supremacy at, at, at the bottom of it. Um, I was really, another phrase that stuck out to me um, from the talk, and I don't remember if Dorothy said it or if she was quoting Lisa Nakamura, but just this idea that capitalism works through the environment. Um, and I was thinking also about like um, environment, the relationship between environment and people and how when you're talking about, you know, indigenous people, like that connection is so strong. And I think that's something that we have a much weaker understanding of a lot of time when we're sitting behind our computers. So that, that's an unresolved thought, but those are some of the um, like entities that were floating around in my mind when she was talking about that. 
Uh, uh, that really resonate, resonated with me too. I couldn't imagine, and, I, and by that I mean I very well could, <laughs> because there have been similar kinds of interactions that I've experienced myself, but I couldn't imagine the experience of um, the, the writer in that story. Um, they were taking a, uh, a, a technologies class and the professor showed a map of their own home region, their own home city, with dots articulating that these are the places that have the highest regions of toxicity and the highest regions of exploitation as well. And, and to be sitting, like, I, I just know firsthand in lots of contexts, but for so many people of color inside of technology classes, listening to stories that are not about you, <laughs> but they are about a, a group of people that you are also defined with and, and, and how those stories are so um they really articulate the power and the like economic uh, uh economic and environmental like violence that takes place in those areas and you're listening to that and you have to um decide whether you attach yourself to that moment or if you divorce yourself from that moment in order to be able to like participate in the room and i think that dorothy's talk didn't talk about that overtly but it did weave in and out the personal connection to these Asian heritages and the personal connection to the like identities that she's talking about and um, I just feel like really akin to that kind of relationship understanding um, those moments like where it becomes really close and personal and when it becomes really distant and informationally driven uh, that was like a intense moment for me in her talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm thinking about that. I mean, one of the things that um, I really appreciated was the closing where, you know, she's telling the story that, like you said, some is informational, some is very personal to the writer, some, you know, is personal to Dorothy too. And, um, but she directs, redirects it back at the listener at the end. Um, you know, and she started opened by talking about this idea of deep listening to subject matter. And then she kind of ends it saying, okay, so you've been listening. So how, how do we learn from this? How do we be accountable? Um, so I really liked that, that call to action, but I'm also um, thinking about what you just said, Ashley, and like, how, how do you, how do you find that accountability um, when it, um, how to say it, like how to find that accountability when when you how do you balance that with like just self protection sometimes right yeah and it's not none of these systems of um, of learning about the history of computing protect the person of color that might be associated to that because the the way that we learn about these systems is also from the perspective of the most powerful demographics as well so there's no like training that that a, a facilitator would go through to say oh this is the part where we talk about how this technological company ravaged like an entire black and brown neighborhood i wonder if there are black and brown people who maybe have family who live in that neighborhood or even live there themselves like there is no framework for that so it becomes like listeners choice to engage or listeners responsibility to engage or or more so like listeners like uh, additive trauma so i think that that's um, the accountability part is still sort of murky because we have no we don't have we haven't built a, a conversational framework for addressing that head on or, or in any kind of confrontational way right and that's why talks like dorothy's are so important because they like peel back all of that um all, all of that like covering that we have to talk about these things abstractly and really talk about it from the human's perspective, like the true lived experience of, of like marginalized folks who have made this technology possible. It becomes uncomfortable because we're not used to it that from that positionality, you know. Definitely, I, I, I'm just thinking about um, all of the problematic ways in which technology, like the pedagogy of technology, like how the speed kind of like the, the, the way in which it's taught and the way in which things are glossed over, like the violence of, of what goes into making a microchip is glossed over when you're trying to learn what a microchip is. Hi, Hi. we're back. <laughs> 
Um, we're back live because you yes. just saw our faces technically <laughs> in a pre-recorded video. It's the magic of uh, the internet. <laughs> the end. <Yep. clears throat> um, and so we are so excited because we're closing on such a dynamic note. We've got three spectacular panelists. And this is really cool for us too because the Computer Mouse Conference in 2019 also closed on a panel and it was so much fun. And uh, there were so many jumpsuits on that <laughs> panel. There were three like, jumpsuits, two, yeah. three? Three out of four people sitting on that panel yeah. wore a jumpsuit, which is pretty surreal. Yeah. Um, we'll find out in a second if Io is still wearing a jumpsuit. But we've got one returning uh, panelist from last year, Io, and you'll hear a bit more about him in a moment. We've also got some incredible, incredible people that we really look up to, Allison and Mimi. Um, before we get to reading their bios and telling you more about them, um, I just want to shout out a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is that we're in the last chunk of the conference. This is really the last opportunity to contribute to the computer mouse zine. So Netta Bomani, with help from the coding train, um, and Dan Schiffman's Twitter bot, is still, they're, they're still collecting assets. And people have been really freaking out about how incredible the zine has been today. And so this would be a great time to tweet uh, a contribution and get your um, contribution embedded into the zine. Um, because people have been really in love with what they've been seeing, and, and it would be cool to be a part of that artifact. Um, and I think that with that said, we're ready to jump into some of the panels. Yeah, yeah so um, I'm going to introduce Allison Parrish. Allison is a computer programmer, poet, educator, and game designer whose teaching and practice address the unusual phenomena that blossom when language and computers meet. She is an assistant arts professor at NYU Interactive Telecommunications Program, where I uh, was a student of Allison's with Ashley, um, where she also earned her uh, master's degree in 2008. She was named Best Maker of Poetry Bots by The Village Voice in 2016. Allison's computer-generated poetry has recently been published in Ninth Letter and Vetch. She's the author of At Every Word, the book, uh, which collects the output of her popular long-term automated writing project that tweeted every single word in the English language. Um, the word game Rewordable, designed by Allison in collaboration with Adam Simon and Tim Zatella, was published by Penguin Random House in August 2017 after a successful round of Kickstarter funding. Her first full-length book of computer-generated poetry articulations was published by Counterpath in 2018. Great. Um, so we're so excited. Thanks, Allison. Thanks for joining us. Um, I have the privilege okay. of introducing a very dear friend of mine, a uh, constant and regular co-conspirator, Ayo Temowo Okonsiende. And I think that it bears noting that Ayo Io is the person in reference, the, the jumpsuit wearing person. I don't think you're wearing a jumpsuit today. But Io was on our panel uh, last year, and so he's one of two mouse conference returners. <laughs> Only two. And so we're really happy to have you here. I'm going to read Io's bio. A Nigerian-American artist, designer, educator, and time traveler living and working in New York. Okonsiende studied visual arts at Rutgers University, earning a BA. His work ranges from speculative design to physically interactive active works, wearables, and explorations of reclamation. His past residencies include iBeam, IDEO's Fortnite, New Inc., Recess Assembly, and the Laundromat Project. He has presented at the 11th Shanghai Biennial, Afrotectopia, Brooklyn Museum, IO Festival, MIT Beyond the Cradle, the Tribeca, Storyscapes, among others. His work exists between physical and digital spaces across the past, present, and future, and asks us via a technological lens to reimagine notions of race, identity, politics, and culture as we travel through time and space. IO uh, has taught at 9-2-Y, Bennington College, Hostess, CUNY, and New York University. Io is an anthropology MA candidate at the New School for Social Research studying blackness in time and space. He holds an MFA in design and technology from Parsons School of Design in New York, where he serves as an assistant professor of interaction and media design. Asterisk, Io, do you want to add anything to this bio because I think this no, is just no, no, even a few months out of date. No. Yeah. 
I'll, that's that's good. Thanks. Hey, all. <laughs> okay. um, all right. Thank you for joining us, Io. I'm going to introduce Mimi. I just want to also, before I read Mimi's bio, um, Mimi was the first person, I think, that I talked to about this kind of long-term computer mouse project in 2018. Um, and she really just energized the project from the very beginning. So I'm very excited to be on this panel with her. Um, so Mimi Onoha is a Nigerian-American yeah. artist and researcher whose work highlights the social relationships and power dynamics behind data collection. Her multimedia practice uses print, code, installation, and video to call attention to the ways in which those in the margins are differently abstracted, represented, and missed by socio-technical systems. Um, Mimi has been in residence at the iBeam Center for Art and Technology here in New York, Studio XX, Data and Society Research Institute, Columbia University, and the Royal College of Art. Her exhibition and speaking credits include venues like La, I'm gonna just mispronounce, but La Gaiety Lyrique, uh, Fiber Festival, Mao Jihong Arts Foundation, the Pompidou, and B4BEL4B uh, <laughs> Gallery. Babel Gallery. Uh, her writing has appeared in Quartz, uh, Nishan Nu Dan L'Internet, 538, and K Verlag. In 2014, she was selected to be in the inaugural class of Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellows. And in 2017, she was nominated as a technically Brooklyn Artist of the Year. Mimi earned her MPS from NYU. Uh, ITP. In 2018, she served as a creative in residence at Olin College for Engineering, and she is a visiting arts professor at NYU Tisch. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So the all-star lineup, people are commenting the chat like, three of my favorite people, what? And <laughs> we really feel that too. So <laughs> thanks everybody for being here. Um, just to sort of like give you an idea of the structure for people who are watching, you can absolutely drop questions into the chat. Emma and I are gonna be keeping one eye in the chat to pull questions into the conversation, but we also, at eight o'clock, will have a Q&A session where you can actively post your question and we can pull those into the conversation more intentionally. Um, so with all that said, uh, I think we're ready to get into it. So last year, 2019 actually, but uh, 2019 in the first Computer Mouse Conference, uh, Io and Lane, Nooney, and Tiga Brain all joined us for a closing panel and we opened with a question that we wanted to open with today as well, which is really simple. It's just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your first time using the computer mouse. Um, and because Io is our returner, maybe you could retell your story and then we'll go Allison Mimi. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't remember my story. That's um, that's oh the gosh. thing. Classic. I hope I don't retell the same story. Um, I I know that when I was really young, I tried to build a computer mouse, or I tried to build something to to interact with the computer, um, and I was not successful. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's one of my stories. Um, yeah. I, I remember. I remember some of that story. Yeah. Um, it was like a story about your mom or dad working on a computer, oh, building a computer oh. together. Is that yes, about? yes, yes. It was a story about my dad. Um, we got a computer. Um, no, <laughs> I was I was crocheting. Yeah. And my dad saw me crocheting. And he, he got me a light bulb and a battery and connected it. And then ever since then, I was like, oh, wow, computers. But then I also oh. love um, crocheting as well. So I've continued to crochet and do computer stuff, wearable technology. Yeah, yeah. right, right. That's the story, which is, which is really cool because it connects to so much of what Sai presented yesterday and what Dorothy just presented before this. But maybe we'll put a pin in that and go to Allison. Um, and, and ask the same question. What was your first experience with the computer mouse? Yeah, I was I was thinking about this actually, um, which is weird because I didn't know this was going to be your question. <laughs> um, I think I was thinking about it in terms of the fact that I feel like maybe most of the people who are presenting at the conference, their first interaction with the computer included a mouse. 
just based on the ages of everyone as far as mm-hmm. I can as far as I can guess. And mine didn't. I I I don't remember. Um, I definitely like was using computers before there were mice. Mm-hmm. Um, like our first uh, home computer was a, a Tandy Color Computer Two that did not have a mouse. Um, so I was trying to think through like where what what is the most likely scenario where I would have encountered a mouse for the first time because it wouldn't have been in school. We would have had like Apple IIs and the Apple in 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 the lab. It wouldn't have been at home. Like my my dad had like a IBM PC that he used for work stuff. Um, so it was, it was definitely a Mac. So it was either, it was either like a classic Mac that was at my friend's house across the street because they always had the newest computer stuff. (laughs) Um, or maybe it was like at my dad's work or something like that. Um, I, I do have a very distinct memory of like with my friend, um, going through their family computer and we found this folder labeled MISC, (laughs) M-I-S-C. And we didn't know that it stood for miscellaneous. We thought it meant music. So we, we clicked into the folder and just started messing around. I have no idea. We probably messed it up really bad. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, I, uh, George Fisher, if you're, if you're watching, I'm sorry. I messed up your miscellaneous folder 34 years ago or whatever. But yeah, I don't, I don't really remember. But it must, have been, it must have been a scenario like that. Cool. Amazing. That's a great yeah, story and makes me I, I am like a post mouse my I don't remember either, but I'm definitely a post mouse um computer user. Like I didn't have a pre mouse computer experience. The great the great generational divide. Yes. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> the well known generational divide. <laughs> cool. Uh, Mimi, what about you? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't think I can remember. Y'all had nice little neat stories. That was very convenient of the two of you. Um <laughs> I don't think I remember the first time I used a mouse. I do remember. I'll say my most vivid earliest memory is probably when I was about eight or nine. And we had an old, we had some Mac in our house. And I remember there was a summer when one of my good friends who lived close enough that I could walk or bike to her house, we were obsessed with just emailing each other back and forth. And it was like weeks where we didn't see each other in person because we were like, oh my God, have you heard email? Let's do this. And it's so funny thinking about now. Cause I'm like, that is, <laughs> that is not how I would feel today. I can tell you that. Um, that's probably my most like vivid earliest memory since I don't remember the first time. Well, it's still a good story. That's a great. Yeah, I like the stories that just kind of bring you back to like uh, when you would just walk down the street or I don't know. To somewhere like close by to your friend's house to use their computer. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It feels really far away from my experience yeah. these days. Well, yeah, I'm never walking <laughs> to your house to use your computer. Not these days. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, now you could just um, VNC into it. Right. right. As we do. We right. we've been doing a lot of yeah. Uh, we have been using this tool called Team Viewer with. True. Culture Hub, um, yeah, where we, they take over our computer to do stuff. So, so yeah, it's and they take over the cursor, and it's a very weird experience. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to just I um, have a question, like th- so. This year, our theme um, is a little more specific. Uh, it's what does the mouse see. Um, And so a bunch of people uh, throughout the conference, as you may have seen, have stretched this question in different ways. Um, So like Charlton asked, does the mouse see race? And he actually, he answers the question. He says, yes, it does, because computing technology is predicated on race and racism and racialization. Um, David kind of asks, says that the mouse sees and clicks and that clicks have a kind of currency and that there's all this like meaning that's multiplied on top of the click. Um. Yeah, and so we wanted to basically ask you the unfair question, as if you were presenting like right now, like what what does the mouse see? <laughs> and I think that this is like you know our speakers had weeks, months to think about what the mouse <laughs> sees. Um, but I would be curious to know, like you know, measured in clicks, seeing racing pixelization on a on a trackpad, like. What is the mouse, what would you say that the mouse sees? Or if you would just push back on this question, because I also, like, I feel like I still, I just can't even answer, begin to answer this question, even though so many people have answered it throughout 
today and yesterday. Yeah. Um, yeah. I could take a stab at, at, at it, you know, and maybe this is coming from, you know, from the research that I've been doing lately. I, I'm thinking about time and I think Ryan touched on this a little bit um, and really thinking about the scale um, of time. So I, I in, a, in a sense, for me, the mouse is sort of complicit in this um, idea of um, the proliferation of violent images, right? And thinking about the time it takes. So let's, if we, if one takes time as um, just even think about the, com the mouse itself and the clock in the computer and the needing to have that time signature correct to communicate, but then also scale back and think about the anxiety of, you know, clicking on something and the immediacy of, okay, that it appears and what happens when that breaks down, right? But then now thinking, adding violence and, and race to that and thinking about over the, over the summer, all these videos and images that have been coming out and it is the mouse that enables you to, to view that, right? And by clicking on it, you see those images. And then even beyond that, like then being able to scroll those images, right? Move them faster or slower, pause it at the particular place. So for me, I'm thinking about, and then further, further more, right, then the multiplication of that um, over, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people and what that means in terms of the, the way the mouse manages the, the dissemination of these, uh, of, of these images. Um, and I, I'm going to bring this um, back to, um, to Fela Kuti's um, um, What to Get No Enemy um, and because he talks about water in this sort of um, cosmic way, right? He starts out this really external about water being used to wash and then water being used to drink. And then in the center, the core of it is, he says, it, when your child dies, you use water um, and in terms of crying. And I think about trauma and, and, and time we're related to the, that ability to sort of instantaneously click, you yeah. know, and to scroll, and to pause. Right. I mean, you're bringing up a lot of parts of Charlton's talk as well, right? Um, yeah. And all of the ways in which, like, the mouse creates more access, as you're describing, more opportunity to be connected to some of the movements you saw in the summer, but also the, the violence of being able to replay and and the like breakdown to destruction of being able to use the mouse in that way. Yeah, it's also, I mean, I think sometimes I feel like um, I put too much weight on the mouse or something, like like to give the mouse, get, to give it over too much, too much responsibility to the mouse. Yeah. But then I think, yeah. yeah, like Charlton says, like the mouse is the thing that made personal computer, like that made this infrastructure possible, like so, the mouse yeah. is responsible, you know, given its kind of relational um, position in computing for, f yeah, yeah, for kind of sustaining, um, yeah, all of the violence which, which it sustains. I don't know. Yeah. It's right. Like but, it's, but it's also cool to think about the mouse in that violence in the, in the timeline of history that the mouse has, like, witnessed and then thinking about it in, like, time in yeah. relation to Ryan's talk as well is yeah. really, is really interesting. A and... You know, no pressure if you don't feel engaged to this question, but I'd be curious, Mimi or Allison, if you had like a, an interpretation of what the mouse sees as well. <laughs> you just, you just, you took a breath in, Mimi, as though you were about to be No, Allison, you did. I definitely gestured okay. to you. Um, but no, okay. no, I, I mean, I'm happy to talk. I can also but, talk. I don't right. have anything um, really, really. I don't know if I have too much significance to add. I, I don't know. I have actually thought about this question because it's just come up, it's the theme of the conference. And because I think loads of people, all of the people who have spoken or contributed things over the past two days have had such, such lovely little takes around this. Whereas I just keep thinking about my own mouse. I'm like, what is my mouse seeing? Oof, too much. <laughs> um, or, and then I, I can like end up back at this place this thing that you were coming coming to as well, Io, this mouse as witness, as mediator, as tool, as complicit, and then also as not, <laughs> as relational necessarily, definitely. 
also as something, you know, the C, I think I also come back, I've been circling around this question, so I don't have any good, good answers, just the little things I'm thinking about, the things it brings up. I think about how I, the C, what is the mouse C? Is prob that C is probably the, the thing I struggle with the most. And I think, why does it have to be C? And I think I'm not the only person I, other people over the past two days, I'm sure have brought this up too. Because when I think of the mouse, I think so much more of, of touching and sensing rather than seeing. And I don't have a good answer, but that's, yeah. that's sort of where I end up. Yeah, I mean, if it helps, I don't have a good answer either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but touch is something we want to talk about. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the way in which it's relational. We're coming back to that too. Allison, okay. what say you? Um, so I was, I'm, 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 I'm trying to think about this. I don't. For some reason, I didn't imagine that I'd be helped <laughs> to to answer this question, even though it's right there in the name of the of the conference, and I'm on this panel that doesn't have any other. Uh, any other mission other than to talk about the conference? <laughs> um, I, I think I think the talk that 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 really connected with me the most was um, David Baring Porter's talk mm -hmm. um, about the the semiotics of the click. Um, something that I I feel like happened in that well didn't didn't really happen in in that talk, but but um, thinking about the click as this like. Um, as this like very rudimentary biometric device that is like constantly recording real time information about what I'm doing in remote parts of the world, um, which of course is is very true. Um, that was really disturbing to think about. Yeah. It made me think the, the the next thing that I jumped to in my mind was like um, where like uh, heat maps of where people click on a web page, and this is just something you can bring up and like analytics tools if you do web development like it will actually show you like a picture of your web page with like you know a heat map of where people are most likely to click mm -hmm. that's also what um you can get heat maps of that for where people look when they look at your web page right or at a book or something like that they're actual mm -hmm. studies where they show like this is this is where people's eyes are drawn and like the order in which their their eyes are drawn to things so i think something that that maybe didn't come out in these talks or maybe that I didn't that I didn't notice is the fact that where you move your mouse also isn't entirely intentional right like the the content the thing that's on your screen is conditioning where your mouse moves the same way that a written text conditions where your eye moves from from one point um, or like over time while you're while you're looking at the page so like the mouse is um, I guess I, here's 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 the clever phrasing that I came up with. It's like maybe the important question isn't what the mouse sees, but where does the mouse look? Mm. Eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like and it. and where is the gaze of the mouse drawn? Maybe against yeah. our intention. Right, right. Sorry, I feel proud of that. <laughs> I, I feel like I mean, I, now I just wonder. <laughs> it was nice. That's yeah, good. yeah, that's good. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, um, I, I'm just now curious to know, like, in my own uh, use of a mouse and my own eyes on the screen, where they don't, where they match up and where they don't. Yeah, like, where my mouse is kind of making yeah. its own, or my hand is making its own decisions and my eyes are trying to do something else, you know, like, where right. there's uh, tension between those two. That would be really It would strange. be interesting to see a heat map of the mouse, yes. of mouse movement and mouse clicks over a heat map of, of eye movements. Right. Yeah, I feel a like... A very, be... very intense choreography that, that definitely people are getting paid a lot of money to to <laughs> choreograph to make us click on the things they want us to click on. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really overla yeah. overlaid across some s different kinds of like web styles and seeing what prescribes like what kinds of interactions and things mm -hmm. like that's really interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think Yeah, this Yeah. Go ahead, Mimi. I was just going to say to this to this point it reminds me. I have this work which is a video piece, but it's sort of a scrolling thing. And there's one part of the piece, which is that there's a cursor on the screen. You can't tell I'm moving my cursor while I'm saying this, but I, there's this <laughs> cursor on the screen. And the cursor is sort of a stand in this mouse, which is then a stand in for a person who is moving the mouse. And it is meant to really do this exact sort of choreography and like this, this moving back and forth that you're talking about, Allison, of directing people in this work 
not just where to look, but also sort of reminding them that it's a piece and there's meant to be right. somebody else looking at it. And so it's something I hadn't thought about until you brought this up, but this use of the mouse where the mouse in the, I'm not getting paid a lot of money to do this for websites. I'm getting paid small <laughs> amounts to make <laughs> little little work about this. But really there is this like implication that this cursor stands in for that leads into this whole network that ties to this mouse, who's touching it, what you're seeing, and then where it directs you. And then of course that like takes you back to what the uh, the work is about. And it just it did just make me think about it in a different way. So so thank you. I mean there's a there's a question of, you know, is the input that you're getting from the mouse is that does that say something about the individual, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if it does, how deep does that say? Does that what does that say? How deeply does that go? Um, if one thinks about, let's say, anxiety, right? Um, I, th there, I read a, a, a paper in um, behavioral and information behavioral informational technology that said that uh, this study where they tried to see if the uh, the clicks could, if one could s measure the anxiety of the individual via the clicks, and they found that there was no correlation, right? But at what point does the mouse and the behavior of the mouse leave the body and move into, let's say, the screen, right? Or mm -hmm. into what the mouse, mouse sees as opposed to what the individual um as opposed to the be, as opposed to it coming from the individual, right, yeah. right. Well, this was this is a theme that came up over and over again in the conference mm -hmm. was um, the movement of the mouse is a kind of um, divination, yeah. and divination yeah. and biometrics are like two sides of the same coin. Um, that's interesting. It's definitely interesting to think about. Mm. Yeah, Camila and Sai both mentioned divination as part of their talk. And Camila, kind of as like a surprise at the very end, um, talking about the mouse as a kind of like planchette, something that will allow you to point to things, to select things, to have like power, like to have agency in a, in a particular kind of way, like a divin divination tool, which was a was a surprise to us because we didn't we never prompted Camila to go in that direction and I don't think Camila knew that Sai's talk was entirely about the mouse and divination but uh, it was it was really interesting and I think has really shifted the way that I've thought about the mouse as well same I mean I think just 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 thinking about it uh, I like I really like this question at what point does the mouse leave the body yeah. um, I am speechless I, not, about it not, in fact <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to bring something up from um, last Computer Mouse Conference. On the panel, we talked about um, the singularity, right? And I think this idea, of this question of when the mouse leaves the body has been answered between then and now with um, Elon Musk's um, neuro, Neuralink, right? Mm -hmm. At what, like, is the, 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 the mouse now not being a part of the not being digital finger wise but now being cerebral um i don't know i think it just re raises so many questions uh, specifically about at what point does it leave the body or if it does leave the body in the new iterations of the mouse of the mices that we're going to be seeing mouses is <laughs> mice, <laughs> yeah yeah, wait, can you say more about like this cerebral, um, scary Elon Musk thing? Because I don't, I feel like I <laughs> shut down every time. Yeah, <laughs> well, comes Neuralink, uh, Elon Musk Neuralink just um, a few weeks ago demonstrated the, the they had a, a, a monkey using a joystick to control something to get food. They disconnected the joystick and the mm -hmm. mouse, I mean, the, the monkey was still moving the joystick, but the signal was coming from the brain. And then they finally just moved the joystick and now the, the, the monkey is controlling the cursor on the screen with um, neural activity. So it's sort of moving the, the, the control of the mouse away from the digital, right? Mm -hmm. um, before it was connected to the computer physically, right. then it was wireless and now it is brain control. 
Well, that's really, well, first of all, accurate in the reference to scary. Um, <laughs> but it's also really interesting because we have spent a ton of time this year talking about the necessity of touch and how mm -hmm. it creates mm -hmm. new layers of engagement because you have to engage because you have to touch this object and so thinking about some of the things that Nabil has discussed over the conference and, and Dorothy has discussed over this conference in comparison or in uh, you know in juxtaposition to the story that you're telling I mean like it's it's a little bit it's a little bit spooky to see what could be lost in removing the sense of touch from uh, that interaction I think maybe that's an argument for why people won't actually use those neural interfaces is mm -hmm. because of the because of the tactileness of it, um, and also like the 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 way that using a mouse is socially embedded mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse. Like another thing that I was thinking of with that discussion about gaze is the fact that I am extremely attuned right now, having been doing like teaching for many, many dozens, perhaps hundreds of hours over Zoom over the course of the past year, I know what you're doing based on what your face is doing on the screen, yeah. right? Like, I can tell if you're scrolling a web page. I can tell if you're, like, typing something on your phone. Oh my gosh, Allison right? I can is tell if AI. you're, like, about to talk, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and that's all based on, like, and part of the reason that I can do that is because if I'm moving my mouse around the screen, like, you can see what I'm doing with my gaze, right? Mm -hmm. And I can also, you know, you, I can, you can hear my mouse click when I'm clicking the mouse, even, even though we're not in the same place, right? So yeah. there's something, it's, it's a socially embedded thing as well that I think is desirable. Um, and it would be, I don't know, it, it seems, to me, it seems... Uh, for those reasons, because it, it gives us presence and it gives us this tactile feedback, it seems unlikely that like a purely like like a brain interface pointing device would become popular. It also seems kind of, I don't know, inconvenient, messy, potentially. <laughs> uh, that sounds, sounds but really I'm interested messy. to hear what other people think on that on that issue. I feel uh, like we've had this promise of like neural interfaces for the past 30 years and they've never actually come to pass. Right. That's, that's, I think, um, Allison, you're, you're right, except if you get a feedback from, mm -hmm. from right? So what, what does it mean to have a neural click? How mm -hmm. do you satisfy that, that, you know, is it that, and it, this is all connected to like the more, the motor, um, the motor cortex, right? So does, does the click that comes back, does that make it feel as if you have a click on your finger? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, or does it give you some sort of, oh, I don't even want to think this is horrible. Um, give you like some sort of uh, oxytocin release when you click, neurally click a like mm -hmm. in Facebook. I mean, it already does, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, I, um, I just, it's making me think of like, you know, the mouse's genesis and Douglas Engelbart and his whole, the mouse inventor's whole kind of thing was to have uh, computers and humans in symbiosis. It was kind of this like anti, uh, like autonomous AI move. But now like this kind of neural click, I think it's like the mouse, the mouse is like the thing that's allowed us to even get there. But now I'm wondering like, you know, uh, I don't know, like, what if we had, what if, like, the, the uh, we were able to have, like, a neural interface, a neural computing interface uh, before personal, compu like, what if this was a possibility before personal, personal computers were a possibility, and would it even be a click, like, would it be this kind of way of pointing and clicking, would it be something else more sensory? I don't know, it's, it's, it's strange to hold on to, like, the pointing and clicking in, in, yeah without having to use like a screen or any kind of interface between you, I think uh, strange. But I feel like this maybe is like Doug Engelbart's dream where like we're just <laughs> in symbiosis with like, you know, in this like intellectual symbiosis with the world around us. I don't know. Yeah. Well, what you say does, does remind me of the pattern that we just see over and over again, which is the new thing that comes is defined in terms of what was there before. And so this, that click 
when you're like, what? Well, if this were reversed, which is of course hard to even imagine and would mean playing this sort of mental Tetris game, so many things, like at the highest level. But the idea of the click not resonating in the way that it does, that it does now is so just, it's just hard. It's hard yeah. to, to even yeah. to fathom, you know? Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, and I think the the click uh, and the way that the click resonates show, showed up in Cesar's talk as like also tied to our nostalgia. And I think the reason why we like care about it is because it originated at the time that it did. So it's really it's it's hard to untangle ourselves from all of that to feel something different about it. But it's definitely an interesting speculative activity. Um, I think that tied to all of this as well beyond the click is the the touch that mm -hmm. initiates that click as well that feels like such a necessity as part of the sensory you know i think that uh there's you can see it in all of the designs of the mouses or mice over the last however many years that like they're designed in different ways. We were holding a mouse just yesterday that was like, mm -hmm. this feels like a different kind of personal <laughs> object. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that like there's, there's so much about the touch that is also connected to why the click, like those two things are really in tandem for a lot of computer users. Um, in Shannon Mattern's talk, there was a rapid array of visuals of different computer mice and some of our culture hub collaborators were like that's the mouse i loved in like the <laughs> early 2000s so we, you know we only love the, the the love comes from also the experience of the touch that's also connected to the experience of the click because as david said the click is also a switch and different kinds of designs also emit a different so kind of sound so it's it's so it's so tied to touch and so one of the things that uh, Emma and I were talking about was we've just we've just been so um, excited about what Nabil was discussing when they were talking about touch. Um, Nabil uh, was referencing a an Instagram bio that they have never been able to resurface, <laughs> but that they wholeheartedly agree with, which is that all sensors are touch, all senses are touch, and Nabil encouraged us in the talk to think through touch in a particular kind of way, mainly that with every time we hear the click of the mouse, we think about all the hands that the mouse was in before it got to our hands, um, which was really convenient because it tied into Mindy, Sue, and Ali Na's um, interview article. I don't know if you wanted to read that. Yeah, uh, I read this quote yesterday, but I, um, this is Ali's uh, quote. Uh, they say, using the computer mouse actually enhances your capacity to have touch and to touch space. There were these ergonomic studies that show that the more you use the computer mouse, the more your body is capable of sensing touch around it. For me, for Ali, this was this radical shift. Yeah, mm. it's really connected to Dorothy's work as well. Yes. We're taking you on a, on a journey yeah. through the conference <laughs> and realizing we've been talking for like six yeah. minutes about um, everybody we like at the conference. I think we, but, I mean, yeah. I think we are, it, there's something, I think because we started with this question, what does the mouse see, yeah. which is so much in this like uh, visual field, this like non-touch kind of realm, I think when people just kind of brought touch up into that question, um, it's something that we, both really responded to, and we think we, we were, I mean, our question is, um, and we're thinking about how we were taught technology, like how we were taught to work with technical objects, and how we were taught to make them and break them, et cetera, at ITP, other places. Um, and so we're wondering, like, how, how would one create pedagogy that creates, like, more space to acknowledge like the importance of touch or like the mm -hmm. the kind of ways in which touch is like very much embedded in these things which seemingly have not very much to do with touch. Yeah. Um, Even the object history, Dorothy talks about all the yeah. women, particularly women who've been weavers in their black and brown indigenous communities who have mm -hmm. touched circuits that have been embedded, touched to design and build the circuits that have been embedded inside of our tech. Like, how do we create space to acknowledge them? How do we create space to like revere and, and appreciate that skill instead of like the, or maybe just instead of is my is my bias, but maybe alongside the Doug Engelbarts or alongside some of these <laughs> other people who have been integral to technology.
outside of our tech. Like, how do we create space to acknowledge them? How do we create space to like revere and, and appreciate that skill instead of like the, or maybe just instead of is my is my bias, but maybe alongside the Doug Engelbarts or alongside some of these <laughs> other people who have been integral to technology. Secondary is that, question. Is that a question. Well, there's another. On? There's another. Just like I think we wanted to like just touch on those things, but also um, <laughs> I think uh, we were wondering how much weight that each of you give in your practices to touch in the things that you make. Like, yeah. is touch something that is important to the things that you're that you're making and that you're putting out into the world? Yeah. Um, but also because you all teach, so also just from a pedagogical standpoint, also if touch. Uh, is important in in specifically in teaching in like a tech in a tech space. I think where like it's not. I mean, yeah. I think it depends on what kinds of tech spaces you're in, but yeah. You know, as an opening to maybe a response because <laughs> we have taken you on a journey. You know, Io, for instance, you spend so much time connecting with communities that have both in a real time historical sense and in a fictitious um, speculative sense thinking about how people have designed usually people of color have designed technology and I, I wonder if you're could you imagine how we might create more pedagogical space to hold them at the center of our tech education like how could we hold them in the in the center of that yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think back to a student that I had at, at Parsons um, that talked about the fact that his grandmother would say that she was half Native, um, um, Indigenous um, Native American, right? And he said in his thesis talk that that was not true. And I countered and I said, wait, what do you mean that was not true? It was true for her. She needed to construct that story, right? And to, to, to be able to survive. And, you know, this is also about this, about um, Hartman's um, critical fabulation, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the construction of these, these identities, these speculative spaces um, that allow for that allow for survival. So thinking on that in relation to the mouse, you know, if we say that there is this history of oppression that's attached to it, um, how do we create new spaces? Um, how, how do we how, how can we create new spaces to rethink that? And then I think what's really key there is then how do we make those real spaces real? So how do we make mice, mouses, that let's say when they scroll against a, a video of um, of a black body actually being extrajudicially killed, will not, uh, excuse me, I'm on, on the call here, um, that will not um, allow you to, you know, play the video right. or that will twist mm -hmm. that, twist our, rea our supposed reality into that fabulation. Right. And I think for, for that, you know, it's touch is absolutely important. I'm thinking about teaching over the um, pandemic and actually not being able to demonstrate to students, you know, this is how you connect wires together. Here, take the battery, stick it on your tongue. This is, you know, what it feels like. I think physicality being in proximity um, and touching is, is absolutely critical. Yeah. Yeah, well, I wasn't expecting this hypothetical mouse that you're describing. I wasn't expecting uh, the idea that like a mouse could avoid certain actions or could um, change our reality as you're describing. I think it's really, really interesting. And I guess also just like helps me start of sort of think about how we how when we say that how do we create space in pedagogy, it can it can be in lots of different ways and outside of the classroom and in terms of technological design as well. Um, Allison, how much weight do you give touch in your practice? I think it would, we were really curious as a person who works in like tech and poetics. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it's a super interesting question. 
I let me think about it for a second. I think I think that there there's like a really easy way to turn that question into because when you think about um, language and touch, primarily what I do is I, I work with language. You start thinking about physical materials, right? Like the the paper and the ink on the paper and things like that. Um, and I think that's something that I've been trying to emphasize in my own work recently is thinking about thinking about physical material and thinking about how how the material substrate of of writing is something that you know can be a part of the piece, <laughs> even if you are working with computation, which otherwise tries to abstract language in various ways. But I I I want to I I'm. I don't want to limit the, that idea of touch just to like that physical dimension of it, even though that I feel like that's where we're going to be drawn automatically, even though I don't know what else I'm going to say counts as touch in that, <laughs> in that area. I think um, what I try to do in my own practice in my teaching is try to bring out embodiedness. Um, and that's not the same thing as touch, but um, always making sure to emphasize with linguistic artifacts and especially digital linguistic artifacts that they they come from the body they come from speech acts that have been recorded turned into data um, whether those are speech acts from like somebody talking or speech acts from somebody typing or speech acts from somebody like using their phone or maybe using their mouse to type i don't know of anybody that does that but it's certainly <laughs> possible um, and that we make it physical when it comes out of the computer. So emphasizing like both parts of that and how the output depends on the, the physical output depends on the physical input. Right. Um, and that's sort of like, I feel like that's like sort of a superset of, of touch. Um, but I think that's the best, that's the best answer that I have for that. From a, from a pedagogical standpoint, I think um, the, it, it's really an uphill battle to make students care about that issue. Cause I don't think we're, we're not just talking about like tactileness here. If we can, if we can usefully separate these two categories of like yeah. something that involves feeling and something that involves touch, which I think we're talking about in like a more specific way as in like uh, uh, an encounter with the actual material, the material of the world and not just like yeah. the thing that's predetermined by the abstraction of the system that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that um, where the glitz is and where the money is in technology right now is in those systems that abstract away the material history of the of of the artifacts that we're using, right? Um, to make them replaceable, so that we have an infrastructure where you know you upgrade to the next thing and everything works seamlessly and and things like that. Um, so that's that I think is like really the difficult thing to do in pedagogy is to say like. I know you're super into this new machine learning model that came out, um, but we need to think about how that actually came into existence. Like we can't just use it as it is. Yeah. Um, so getting students to sort of like understand that the thing that has all of this like shininess to it um, uh, may need to be further uh, investigated. And not even to like a critical, like I'm not saying that every single uh, interactive art piece needs to be a critical interactive art piece. Um, but just getting students to consider that extra step is is kind of a struggle. Fortunately, I've had students like you who didn't need to be controlled to, uh, cajoled to, to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mimi, what do you what do you think about that? Ashley, I have so many thoughts. I'm trying to put them in order. I've been trying to put them in order this whole time, and then they get more jumbled as I listen, listen to the other two talk. Um, maybe I'll start first with the first, that original question that y'all you would ask when the two of you were going back and forth in this lovely way, when you said how you, the two of you said you're thinking about touch and thinking about the way you've been taught technology, and how do we create space for that? Yeah. And I think that the answer to that is kind of simple and very complicated. And the simple part is we just do. And the complicated part is to do that in a way that doesn't rely upon the tools that we already have or the particular ways in which we know to create space for things. Um, I'm gonna try to make that make sense. I think that 
in some, like, I think, you know, so much of what we've inherited in a lot of the spaces that we are in, and especially the university as an institution, as machine, as um, complicit and involved in so, in the maintenance of so much, is, of course, site is foregrounded, and site is very much about legibility. And I, I guess the thing I'm trying to artic figure out how to articulate is that in making room for other senses and also putting them, not just senses, other ways of knowing, because I think that's really what we're talking about, yeah. that might also demand not having them be, it doesn't, it's not like touch, but make it visible. <laughs> Show me how we're doing touch in the same way. I don't think, I think mm -hmm. it means coming at this from a completely different point and really thinking, well, what are other ways of knowing? And maybe it's not in the same tradition that mm -hmm we've inherited in the classroom maybe this is something else and maybe it means thinking like also push pulling away from some of the the hierarchies for what we think of as something being uh foregrounded or centered which is like it's on a syllabus and you know we talk about it in a class maybe that means a different way of approaching things entirely which i realize is a kind of is a i know it's, it's a slippery thing um a slippery thing to hold but I think I also feel this way because I, I also really enjoyed uh, Nabil's uh, talk. I loved what they were, as, oft, as, as always, I loved what they were yeah. saying. And I, and I, but then I also was like, oh, I'm not really ready to, I still, you know, we're jumping to touch. I'm still here thinking about sound too. I think there's mm -hmm. something so immediate about sound and this click and mm -hmm. what, so, you know, with sound, it's, sound is about this temporality, something you often, it suggests the kind of like, embeddedness and connectedness <laughs> as well. And so that's not to say, oh, this is more important, but maybe part of what we're talking about is a kind of fluidity of being able to switch between different ways of knowing and be okay with that, mm -hmm. depending on what it is that we are trying to know and how and who with, because I do think also a lot of this is connected to, when I think of touch, when I think of all of these, I'm, we're thinking of a kind of relationality and relationships and connectedness, mm -hmm. um, or at least that's what I am thinking. Yeah. I think like one one very very simple and I'm not sure if it's effective uh, way to to do this is when I'm teaching to try to break as much as possible the the myth that the computational abstraction is actually encompasses the the phenomena that it claims to encompass, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's like the whole history of computation has that idea that eventually like everything will come underneath computational control, everything will be part of a, a computational ontology that we will eventually be able to understand the entire world as a sequence of zeros and ones. And mm -hmm. like at a very basic level, like just saying to students like, no, that isn't the case. Every computer program, every computational interface is, is a take on that. It's somebody's opinion about it that they've turned into a system in order to express that opinion or you know, turn that opinion into something that controls other people. Um, so just, just trying to point that out, like every single time, <laughs> very insistently that like, even though the person who made this maybe claims that this tells us everything about motion, movement, language in my case or whatever, it's actually just like one potential take on that, right. that has its own, thank you. Do you, are we allowed to ask questions too? Oh, we are. Yeah. Do you, <laughs> <laughs> how does that, how does, does that work? Do you find, I say, I don't know what that means for that to work, but. Well, yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, have I, have I done like a user study and a survey and like use cases and <laughs> have I subjected it to, to design methodology? No, exactly. I, 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 so yeah, okay. I, I don't know if it works. I mean, it feels good. So. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I say so this because I think that is... Maybe that's a sign that it doesn't work actually, is that it feels No, good. it's a sign it doesn't. Um, <laughs> I say that because I think what you're saying is, for me, just one of, I think the best strategies is mm. this taking something and saying, actually, this is not the one way, this is a yeah. way, which means that there are other ways. And that, you know, usually that, it's like a practice, I think. It, for me, I think, now I'm thinking in the classroom, I'm thinking pedag uh, pedagogically, that that is a practice of undoing for me and for like the students that we're often doing together. Right. But I, I think also it's the that there are other ways, but those other ways are also intertwined with the way. 
right with mm -hmm. this with a particular way I, I i'm thinking also mm -hmm. about this you know we've been talking a lot about click about touch about sound mm -hmm. as if they're as if they're different right um when it's a click right it's not just a click right it's also the sound it's also where you are at that time there's all of the all these senses are are, are wrapped into um into one so it, it might be a sort of understanding of the totality of the senses at i'm going to say at a, at those particular times or at those particular moments and maybe i don't know maybe trying to suss something out through that right mm -hmm. right yeah i think the i mean i i think i agree like when we're talking about touch that it is we're also just talking about different ways of knowing yeah. um yeah. and it makes me think like yeah can we I also had this thought, like, do we just need to, like, yeah, suss out more this idea that, like, maybe the mouse is, like, what we're doing in our hand is different from what we're doing with our eyes, and that, like, that, whatever's happening there in, like, the touch phenomena space, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, that we could just privilege that or privilege sound, like, privilege these things more than we do and that that might tell us something new about like how we think or how we come mm -hmm. to know th like how we where mm -hmm. intelligence actually is like it's not necessarily just in like your like it's in your body you know it's right. it's 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 outside your body mm -hmm. also too i so right yeah yeah we've been thinking about how different computational devices also satisfy different kinds of senses, like the same way that maybe like a joystick might satisfy a different kind of like arm and hand sensory experience than like a mouse would, um, and a keyboard as well in different ways. <laughs> we have a we have like a risky question. <laughs> um, not risky in a nefarious way, risky in, in terms of like what we have built. <laughs> but could this conference be about any other object? Like, do you think that this, could be about a different thing than the computer mouse. Like all of what we were talking about, could we be just <laughs> scooping it and talking about it on top of a completely different object? Like a keyboard? Like the keyboard? <laughs> that's a bad example, but like, I feel like, you know, yeah. yeah. any other kind of technical are, object. Yeah. Are y'all trying to pivot? You trying to get ideas from us? <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to, we're trying to crowdsource <laughs> ideas. We're like, <laughs> When we were talking about this earlier, we we're like, oh gosh, like, should we ask this question? I hope people aren't going to be like, when's the yeah. joystick conference? When's the. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm putting together the joystick conference <laughs> next year. I'll have it on the same day as the mouse conference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I, I like that question because I, I think about it in terms of what I would tell my students, right? Um, there's so much in the in the computer mouse. And I almost feel like say, it should just go deeper and deeper and deeper, right? Um, there's something so wonderful about everybody that that um, that, that spoke um, or presented, just new information. Um, and I wonder how, how, how how much information is in is in this? Um, I'm eager to find out. I don't know. Yeah. I think I'll go because I keep stealing the coveted last spot. Um, I think I think for me the answer is yeah, it could be, <laughs> but that doesn't make this any less. It doesn't make this any less important and useful though. I think it could be in that way of just the beauty of focusing on something and then doing that allows you to see so much more and then it shows you all these different relationships and connections and that in itself is a really wonderful act and practice that i think the two of you along with this community that you've assembled have been demonstrating over the years so i yeah yes and that's not a bad thing yeah i think i mean it's i think that's sort of like asking like could this reading be about a different tarot card right mm -hmm. Um, and so like, like maybe said, yes, like, you know, if we, if we drew the, the seven of pentacles instead of the ace of swords or whatever, the reading would be different, but the methodology that you would bring to that reading would be, would be substantively the same. Right. 
Um, I think I think the fact um, that that you're enthusiastic about the conference or, or about the topic about the mouse as as an object, like gives an engine to this this conference that it's actually really difficult to find an engine that can drive organizing an event and getting people to to come together around it. So that's that's pretty remarkable. Um, and just being able to like you know talk to Shannon Matchern and say like you know just pull a random card out of the deck and say like here's the topic of your talk and then have Shannon Matchern do it that's like that's kind of a superpower right um, so I I think I agree with Mimi like yeah you could do it on a different topic but but there's something about the confluence of interest and and personnel and also this object that you're talking about the computer mouse which has so many interesting affordances when we're talking about researching it um, and thinking about it and and using it and clicking with it um, <laughs> that I think kind of makes it a, a unique mm. confluence. It, it, it's such a great constraint. It's it, it's a beautiful yeah. constraint. And, you know, like that is what drives really, really good design. It's like you have a mm. constraint and you just have to work within it. I think mm -hmm. sort of thinking about what sort of iterations, right? Um, so, for example, if one year the conference is about making um, computer m m mice, mouse, 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 <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> that could be, <laughs> I'm going to continue that. That could be yeah. like, right? <laughs> yeah. It reminds me all. of the, um, the, like 10 years ago, uh, Rhizome did a conference about e-cigarettes. Is anybody there for that? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Just like sound it's like off. A day -long conference sound on, off in the chat if you and, were there. <laughs> and I, I for a very long time just thought that was completely ridiculous. That it was just like, <laughs> just like the height of like um, doing something super like trendy in order to gain interest <laughs> around it. Um, now I'm like bad mouthing people. I don't even know who I'm bad mouthing with that. <laughs> But that now I can actually see. Allison. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. It was it was not. <laughs> um, I mean, it did it did teach me like that it's okay to sit one out, right? Like, <laughs> even though this was like an important event at Rhizome, it was like it was fine for me not to care about e-cigarettes and mm -hmm. incorporate them into my practice. <laughs> um, but I think what this conference is showing me is that like actually you can gather people together around a topic that maybe doesn't have this, you know, this immediate, like, um, isn't, isn't obviously urgent. Right. Um, but then like actually show how it is urgent and how people, how paying attention to that thing can, can actually give, um, can be valuable and, and fun and interesting. And what do you, what do you two think? Yeah, and he's, he's out here really asking us all the question. questions, I love it. right? <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't have uh, we shouldn't have let her ask ask that question about asking questions. It's really making me miss being um, in class with both you, Allison, and Mimi, um, yeah. because I, it's just a familiar uh, dynamic. Uh, um, but yeah, I think I mean, like the computer mouse now through doing this conference. I think it's become this like like now it's like this 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 like meta subject for me which 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 yeah has to do with like what it means to study something through through a limit through such a limited object. Um and so I'm curious I mean I am curious like what um what are like the meta things that can be pulled out from this conference that might not be true in a conference about a joystick? Like what are the things that are unique to the mouse? In its, in its limits. Like, it's not just that it's a limited small object. I think that there is, there are some like um, unique limits that I can't name right now, but I think if I were to like study back on this yeah. conference and all the content and the conversation that's come out, out of it, mm -hmm. um, that, that <clears throat> I don't know, it would say something new about the mouse that I haven't been able to say yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, and also, I mean, we've talked about, like, you know, we we did this conference for the first time last year while we were in grad school, and we've talked about running a class, like, that, that's just, like, conference as class. Like, hey, you have an idea? Like, you can do a conference, and it's actually a really kind of, like, amazing way to stretch your research. Like, it's a really amazing way to, like, think differently about what you think about all the time and to get other people... 
uh, to think with you. And it's kind of like a vulnerable act. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely vulnerable yeah. because, I mean, shout out to the poor person who created the e-cigarettes conference. I mean, people could really just pull you <laughs> to pieces, right? And so, like, this is the... the conference was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been, like, the most important intellectual events of the century for all I know. <laughs> definitely not. I mean, there's probably, there's probably, I, I probably shouldn't have even said that thing. About I mean, there's, there's definitely Allison's out there thinking that about this conference. There have to be, you for know, sure. of different... like 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think my, that, uh, go ahead. My, yeah. thinking, my thinking about what, uh, what a joystick conference or a trackpad conference would mean might that elucidate um, the distinction with the mouse, mm. right? What 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 um, what sort of regimes um, uh, are there within a, a trackpad or joystick? I mean, the joystick definitely, right? Like militaristic, blah blah blah, mm. right? But how does that distinguish itself from the mouse? Right. That might be a, a good right. way to start thinking yeah. about it. Maybe. Yeah, that's super cool. And, 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 and also, I don't know where, if you all have done sort of looking at the production of mice, right? And sort of looking at the manu, like going into the into the manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, bringing people yeah. that actually make um, the companies that make it um, um, mice um, come to the conference, and maybe maybe there's something there as well. Right. Totally. Yeah. Well, for me, in terms of this question, you know, I I think about this question a lot because Emma and I, we, we kind of, it's like almost like a long-standing joke in a way, and a long-standing like serious question in a way. But you know, yesterday we talked about the origin of this conference and a conversation that happened um, in our grad program where um, you know Emma had just presented some research and. I, like went over to her in an attempt to make friends as well and to say like you know this could be a whole conference this could be a whole conference on the mouse and the initial idea was that we had version one was that everybody at this conference would make their own mouse just as you said io that the initial idea was that cool we'll bring everybody together you make your mouse from the positionality of like what it means to you to hold this object and what holding an object signifies for your own for your own discipline or your own creative practice or your own life and I think, you know, thinking about that in relationship to like size, physical object for uh, divination is really exciting because that's, I imagine what we, what, what could have manifested if the converse, if the conference was all about like creating one mouse um, per person. I think that uh, for me, it's been really exciting to have the, things that I care about outside of this show up inside of this. So all of the things that I care about in my in my practice broadly around like racism and like dismantling systems of oppression through technology in terms of like acknowledging like black and brown and indigenous women who are like unsung heroes and an unsung like the unsung oppressed demographics of some of this technology. I've been really shocked and excited to see that content show up in this conference because when I when we started this I wasn't imagining that it would be so so often that mm -hmm. that talks would emerge both last year and this year that talk about like the politics of labor that talk about like the politics of like gender and race mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and uh, the politics of the body mm -hmm. so I wonder what that would look like in another object but I am also just like so convinced now that those things, that everything is interconnected and everything is embedded inside of everything. And that the mouse has been like an incredible conduit to just doubling down on all of that research that exists mouseless in the rest of my practice, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Your mouseless practice. My, in my mouseless practice, yeah. yeah I mean, so Charlton, Charlton, I think like he says uh, the mouse is fundamentally relational and I don't know, just the way that he said it with such, uh, I don't know. Conviction, like such, yeah. yeah I, I, I think that is the thing that allows for this conference to happen in the way that it does. I mean, I, I, I don't think that a joystick conference would be quite like this. Um, it, it wouldn't be quite as generative. I don't know, maybe, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I think, I don't know. I think one maybe one limitation on the mouse conference is that there is, and this came up in the in the chat box chat. There's the 
the frisson of, of nostalgia, like mm-hmm. shooting through it. Yeah. So I don't know if like 10 years or 20 years from now, when, when the people who would be organizing a conference like this may never have actually held a mouse, yeah. right? Right? Um, right? They wouldn't have that same connection to it. Right. Also, be, by yeah. my suggestion for next year would be like mouse mouse conference, but you can't mention Douglas Engelbart. I love that. Just completely forbidden. You can't share the image of like the first mouse with like the two little gear heads that move perpendicular to each other. Yes, it's like a, off off limits. I've been I've been <laughs> um, trying to I I like. I've been joking that I'm kind of like a Doug Engelbart lookalike. She, she's this whole dressed. Year. She's dressed as him today. <laughs> I've been trying she's to replace him. him. So hopefully, yeah, <laughs> just yeah, just just repeat, replace every mention of Doug Engelbart with Emma. <laughs> then it's all good. Um, yeah, I think you know we're we're like ten minutes from the end. the The stream mm. is five minutes behind us, so this request might come in five minutes from now. But <laughs> if you have questions for our panelists, the chat is chaotic. It mm. is very exciting, but it's also hard to sift questions from it because everyone <laughs> is responding to each other's question. So maybe if you could write question at the header of your of your line and then write that question afterwards we can ask that question to the panelists um but uh yeah so if you have a question please drop it in the chat and we'll we'll uh make sure that we get we'll try our best to get to it um and i think you know in in the meantime uh we wanted to just sort of kind of land in our portion of this on the topic of Mm fundamental fundamental relationality um, and really, you know, going back to Charlton, we've, we've quoted this so many times over the course of the conference, but um, Charlton talks about how the mouse also forces us to take stock of what we see and how we see it. Um, David uh, Baring Porter's call to action is to become more aware of the kind of multiplied meaning of clicking and the kind of currency that it has within surveillance capitalism, for instance. And so we were hoping that maybe you could comment a little bit on how we might create a new practice of intentionality, knowing all of this. How do we create a new practice of intentionality with with the operation of the mouse and clicks, or is that even possible? So we'll sort of like send that question over to the panelists now, and then again, like if you have questions, drop them into the chat clearly, <laughs> and we will try to also pose this to the panelists too. Searching for questions in the meantime. Yeah. So, what? How could we create a practice of intentionality around how we click, or is it possible? Allison, you're smirking a lot. I don't know if you've got a an incredible (laughs) answer. (laughs) You like really look uh, like you've got something. It's smirk clock. I think I think I've got the the ninety minutes into the panel. uh, Whoopsie doozies. (laughs) Uh, and I'm trying to think of an answer to that, and I can't. I can't come up with, with anything. I think. I mean, so one thing that I do is I don't do any kind of metrics tracking on my websites at all. I don't include Google Analytics. Um, I have no idea who's visiting my websites. Um, I'm not interested in your mouse movements. I don't know how far down you scrolled. Anything like that. Um, I could probably benefit from having that information. Um, but I don't, I don't capture it because I don't think that that's any of my business. Um, and that's something that's really small, but maybe it counts. I don't know. Yeah. I like this question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of related to what we were saying. Like, how long until the mouse is a pointing icon, like the floppy disk has been forgotten and renamed? Like, how long? It, wait, maybe I'm reading this wrong. Um, I think, I mean, I'm reading the question as like how long until like the pointing icon, I I think how long until like obsolesces, like when is the mouse going to become Mm -hmm. obsolete? Like it seems to like, I think for a while I thought it was like this forgotten device and it was already on its way out, but it seems to really still be here. It's really like a main kind of tool for a lot of people who do like heavy work on their computer. yeah, like I, I have, think it's I have one, time. but I use. I've been using it this whole time. It's fine. <laughs> it's wired and everything. It's wired. Wow, that's great. Yeah. 
Uh, I have. Go ahead, I have Io. Three. Three minutes. Three, 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 three of them right here. Wow. Right here. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess um, since we're doing this, one, yeah. <laughs> one really old school. I'm like embarrassed to even <laughs> even does, show does, it. Does he have a ball? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. it's a, a rollerball old school listen wow listen i didn't expect to be asked to show this i was like <laughs> no one has to know <laughs> actually my um my trackpad broke and then i went back to my my old school mouse and i mm -hmm. serving me well um i can i take a stab yeah at the question that you had asked yeah which was about intentionality in relation to the mouse mm -hmm. and I think that there are some there are some really clear question clear answers, like Allison actually gave one that was really nice and really direct. And there's we can talk about e waste and talk about um, oh that is trippy to see myself. I'm seeing, I'm seeing <laughs> can you double, see? double memes. Yeah. Wow, I'm seeing myself with me, the me, me. Ah, yeah. this is awful. <laughs> wow. <can> okay, <laughs> I'm gonna try it's and focus. Up. It's, it's really very terrible. it's very mysterious because we just see one Mimi. So you're seeing into some other <laughs> digital world than we're seeing. <laughs> okay, wow, now it's yeah, better. there we go. Now it's better. Now it's better. Um, well, I was going to say there are some answers to that question around this. This how do we have a more intentional um, kind of I don't know whatever with the mouse along the lines of um, what who David and Charlton were both saying and in, in their talks yesterday, I think, or today, I can't remember, I don't know. Um, and yeah, I feel like there's a part of this that is about the mouse specifically, where it's like, oh, what Allison had said already around clicks and surveillance and tracking. And there's also a thing I think of e-waste and just this kind of question mm -hmm. of, oh my gosh, just the turning over of equipment and that lifeline and what that looks like and where they come from, so on. There's so many questions there. But I also think that the question you're asking is great because it is as much about the mouse as it is about everything else that has to do with the mouse. And so that question of intentionality, to me, you know, we're talking about relationality, but relation the mouse is a relational object, but even within relationship, it's, how do I say this? Oh my gosh, y'all. I'm telling you the shot, I'm like affected. I just got the second vaccine shot today, as everyone knows. Um, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> not like a, not like, a, <laughs> not like a shot that I took. Oh, uh, okay. Relationality, within relationality, I think also that we need to speak about hierarchy because hierarchy is a form of relation of, of relationships. And part of the this, of being intentional, I think being means being aware not just of how things are connected to each other, but the ways in which they are and how that differently impacts different folks. And of course, we've already talked about how black and brown people are like when we these systems often supposedly at the margins, but really at the center, um, but like told we're not at the center. And so I, that's what I come to. Oh, I'm, I'm hitting the 90 minute mark too. I don't know if that made sense. I hope so. Oh Lord, good luck to y'all. I think it makes sense. I tried. I mean, I, I just think um, acknowledging that uh, in relationality, we have to also acknowledge hierarchy uh, is that, oh. that, that hit pretty hard over here at the 90 minute mark. Yeah. yeah, some some rephrasings of that question. Okay. Somebody wrote, "Oh, sorry, Io. Uh, one one yeah, quick I, thing. I, that's so <laughs> yeah, I I just wanted to say like a reframing of that question that I enjoyed was like this question posed, uh, line eight forty four. What would a low click diet look like? And I think that's like a a different <laughs> adaptation of what we asked, which I think is like very. I love that phrasing. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, sorry, Io, go go right ahead. I, I think I'm going to try to tackle the obsolescence um, um, question. I don't, I, I, um, from what I've learned from this conference, um, the mouse is not going to go extinct because the mouse is not what, th this is not the mouse, right? Mm -hmm. The mouse existed before this. This, you know, is just a stand in for something. And I think that that something is that ability to, that, and it comes from maybe from the digit, right? The ability to sort of point, the ability to manipulate. Um, so I, I don't think that the mouse would ever um, disappear. It, it would transform, right? 
But I think the question should really be in the ability to manipulate, right? Would it always, with the mouse, in whatever form it, it, it's in, would it always have that same type of power to oppress? Or is there a way to change that, the way, the way of the finger that points or the, 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 and even, you know, projectiles, missiles, guns, right? Um, is there, those always existed. They, it's just going to change form. Is there a way to change the way that they interact? And I think that's really the question. Is there a way to change the way the mouse interacts, um, whether it's a finger, whether it's a, a stick, or mm -hmm. whether it's a mouse, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think I think that phrasing of like what would a low click diet actually be like? I think that phrasing is revealing because, you know, the idea of a diet is also something you get sold, right? Um like when you go on a when you go on a diet with food, you just buy different food products that are specifically marketed to people mm. who are going on a diet, right? So even even trying to envision like even trying to envision an intentionality around it, um, the metaphor that comes to mind for that immediately to people is like, you know, doing something else that's already preconditioned by 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 capitalism. Right, 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 right. Yeah, Io, you're um um I so we're at we're at like the <laughs> like one minute. Okay. Yeah. Does Io your your comment about um I don't know, the possibility of changing the power of the pointing act. I think that's how I understood it. Like, it, right? Like, is there, is there a possibility for, sh like, shifting um, the, like, oppressive power of the, of the point, the pointer? And it yeah. just reminded me of um, Jonathan Zong's uh, essay that he wrote for the conference. And um, he's, he's kind of, he's talking about in HCI this idea of, like, you know, like we think we are, we are in in this power position. We are clicking. We are like moving data around, etc. But the computer is also like acting back on us. Um, and so, I don't know. I just wondered if, in your question, that has something to do. It, like, whatever is on the other side of like the pointing, I guess. Like, I don't know. In, in terms of computers, like what needs to be there in order for it to act back on us? Yeah. And is that something that like we need to pay more attention to? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, um, Allison um, alluded to this a little bit. It's this this onion of capitalism, right? That you know, it's not it's not the mouse clicking, and you know that it's the system that we're that's embedded in that enables mm -hmm. um, the mouse clicking to happen, or the or the pointing, or you know that because it, we don't have if we don't have a mouse to click, I'm sure capitalism will create a space for something else to do that same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what capitalism does. Mm -hmm. So I think thinking about this within these systems, um, these onion systems, I call them. It, and this also goes um, to a point on pedagogy um, and, and educational institutions as well. Like it's all embedded within these systems that enable and create space for these objects that then do the extraction. Yeah. And yet, I, I completely agree with you. I just want to make sure we don't end on the, the note that I feel like everything I participate in ends on. Because it's right, where it's like capitalism eats everything. It just takes it. it you know, it co-ops it. And that's true. And yet, at the same time, we do see, so, or at least I feel like I've seen, so many different moments where, despite that, there are these little, like, you know, these wonderful glimpses of, okay, this is a different way we can use this. We can think of this little, this device in a different way. And it can allow us to open up some different ways of being that push against capitalism, that push against racial capitalism. And I think in many ways, that is some of the space that y'all have created in this conference. Thank you. Yes. It's amazing. Well, join us next year for the mass conference, number three. Why not e-cigarettes <laughs> as the theme? <laughs> e-cigarette um, e -cigarette joystick, like e mashup. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I, I want I want to thank you all so much, and also Allison and Mimi. My heart goes out to you all. You know, I, I miss you all. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the in the 
come in times we might see each other physically somewhere. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, yeah me too. Adore all of y'all. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Everyone. That was so, so fun. So nice to be with you all. I know. And I'm so glad, Mimi, that you were able to be with us the whole 90 minutes, even though you got <laughs> your <was> shot. <laughs> <laughs> I was honestly not. <laughs> you don't I'm know impressed. how much I'm like holding it. Yeah. <laughs> In a minute, I'm about to melt. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you thank so you much. All. And we we have been so lucky to be in person doing this. Like, it feels like a dream. Honestly, Meg, like, just it's beyond belief that Emma is truly like the only person outside my family and roommate that I have seen in person in so long. And we are still so far apart, um, <laughs> even though it doesn't look like it in this graphic. Uh, but I, I really feel like the three of you are here with us. And I think that's a lot of Culture Hub's magic in, in all of the technology that they've used to make this feel really intimate, even though we're remote. And even though we are, you know, in, various states of spiraling, as Ingrid Burrington <laughs> said at the beginning of the conference. So yeah. um, thank, thank you so much for the three of you for joining us. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for, to Culture Hub for being able to make us feel like we just hung out for 90 minutes. <laughs> you know? We're um, on the big screen there, right? Yeah, you're yeah, on the you're big on, screen. You're on like okay, you're, right. you've got, you're here. You're you're up on a table. You're also in the in the um, dressing room. <laughs> in the screen. Wow, so many different places. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we've got a lot of people to thank. So maybe we'll go through that list now. Okay. Yeah. You do. We can. The panelists can. Yeah. Can go if they we want. We can. To. We can let you go live your lives. <laughs> <It's late. laughs> um, but thank you again. Thank you so much. It was such a. An extraordinary you. pleasure and there's more right. action yeah, in the you. chat so if you wanted to go take a look at all the beautiful things people have to say about you but we'll let you we'll, we'll let you go <laughs> thank you right. thank you bye, bye. 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 oh okay. my gosh we did it <laughs> wow we made it end of computer mouse conference 2021 yeah a million thank yous yeah Thank you to everyone um, who's still hanging out on the site watching. Like, um, we're so thankful for your presence. We're so thankful for all the ASCII art and all of your contributions in the chat. Um, I guess I w yeah I want to especially thank Culture Hub. Yeah. Uh, Deandra, Anthony, Songmin Che, Maddie, Barbara, Bockelman, Billy Clark. Um, for supporting us and getting a lot, like, I don't know, helping us set up this insane setup that we're in um, yeah. and getting to do this with you all. It's been really, really amazing. There's, yeah. a, there's, so, there's so many people behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, that cluster of people made us feel like we were all together, yeah. which is a miracle in COVID times. Yes. The other cluster of people behind the scenes, I mean, hopefully you've got in a different tab, Neto Bomani's zine playing because, oh my gosh, like in some moments I've felt distracted by this zine because it's so beautiful and I'm like, right, we have to host this, I forgot. Yes. So Neta, thank you so much for being such an incredible foundation, like honestly, like the skeletal structure of how we'll look back on this conference. And the coding train has been streaming this zine and you know which also seems so incredible because what a what a what a what a different piece of content for the coding train to be streaming so we're just incredibly grateful for the just the space and the trust that the coding train has had in letting us stream this zine and collaborating so vigorously with our team and with mm -hmm. Netta to make it as beautiful as possible with the like most effort as possible um Thanks to Dan Schiffman, who was championing this in, in many ways, including uh, the design of the bot that allowed for people to contribute to the zine, um, because that has been instrumental in designing something that people could feel connected to, even though we're all like separated and, and we're not able to like hand meta a piece of paper that we wrote on <laughs> to yeah. include in the zine, mm -hmm. you know? I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to go look at the stream of the zine um, yeah. after this. Yeah. Um, we also have the Processing Foundation to thank for helping us be able to host this event and pay the brilliant minds that have <laughs> spoken at yesterday and today. Um, 
we are also in enormous gratitude to the Media Archaeology Lab for similar reasons, for really making it possible for us to bring so many people together. Everyone's in like various levels of financial insecurity, I, I can only assume, because of the situation that we're in. And so we are so grateful to be able to run this conference and also pay people to participate in this conference as well. Yes, big shout out to Media Archaeology Lab and Processing and the Coding Train for, yeah. for um, supporting us. And thank you to all of you for purchasing tickets um, yeah. to directly support the participants and um, Culture Hub. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, thank you to all the speakers yeah. who, <laughs> <laughs> I can't like, and Ed who, run, who ran the workshop because this, everything everybody is excited about is, is really coming back to all of the points um, inside of the talks. And I really hope that we did it justice to have your talks like referenced in other places. Like, you know, we did it because we, we were so blown away by the content, but I host, also hope you felt the thread of your work over the course of the two days, because I, I think people have been um, weaving with us all of the pieces of your, of your talk uh, throughout the evening um, up until this point. Totally. Um, I think also I so this this will we we did record this so this yeah. whole conference uh, the chat and the stream will be archived on this website um, shareable at some point um, what else do we need to say um, I think close? you know our our incredible writers uh, Mindy Sue yes. Ali Na Jonathan Zong really wonderful work that you can go continue to read and continue to engage with. Um, huge thank you to you for giving us some uh, some written content to participate in as well. Um, and I, I think we've thought, I think, I mean, thank you, Emma. Thank you, <laughs> For just Ashley, existing. My, yes. <laughs> so thankful. For, I'm reminded that we had this idea to do like an open gratitude. My, we're just, oh, yeah, yay. that we didn't, yeah, anyway, I have so much gratitude for you and doing this with you. Um, That's right. And uh, we will be doing this again. We, so our, our computer mouse conference schedule is um, every one year and a half, we've decided. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. That'll be um, fall of 2022. 2022. We'll see you again, hopefully, in person. some kind of in-person and online uh, mix yeah. up would be cool, I think, because be cool. uh, I think being online with all of you is really fun this year in a way that hasn't been so fun um, other times this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that we will, with that, let you go put your cursor somewhere else than on our <laughs> website. <laughs> but thank you, thank you so much. It's been it's been just uh, the brightest part of this past year to to culminate in this moment after all this planning and to spend all this time with you so thank you thank you so 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 much um and uh we'll see you we'll see you next time that's it Bye. <laughs> that's all. thank you <laughs>